Upstart Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Bow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today's Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. Roland Martin Unfiltered broadcasting live from Cedar Hill, Texas, where later I will be moderating a town hall uh, with Jasmine Crockett, state representative who is seeking to become uh, the next member of Congress. We will be, uh, there'll be, uh, of course, in a couple of hours after our show. Uh, but coming up next on the Black Star Network, we continue to cover uh, the tragic white domestic terror attack in Buffalo. Uh, a woman says she called 911 and was ru- rudely treated by the 911 dispatcher who hung up on her. Wait until we show you what she told a local television station. Also, uh, Democrats are moving to establish white domestic terror offices all across the country. They're looking to pass that bill in the House. Also, uh, Representative Stacey Plaskett blast Republicans for advancing the white supremacy theory, uh, replacement theory. We'll show you exactly what she said today on the House floor. Also, uh, on today's show, we're covering election results that took place yesterday. A number of African-American candidates won their races. Uh, We'll show you exactly what happened. Some folks are also lost in Kentucky, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. And of course, as I said, the runoff here in Texas is on Tuesday. And as you see, I've already voted. Uh, Also, folks, uh, on uh, today's show, uh, a former NFL player who has been dealing uh, with massive injuries, dealing with all kinds of problems, literally is moved out of the hospital by 15 Police officers will explain to you what happened to Lacey Leonard. It is a shocking, shocking story uh, as he continues uh, to battle uh, his post-career injuries. Also on today's show, what's up with this white woman out of Virginia who literally says that her biracial son is stopped doing his chores and she's suing because of critical race theory? These white folks have lost their mind, I told y'all. Plus, Marvin Sapp stops about to talk about his new CD. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Live at All right, folks, we are live here in Cedar Hill, Texas, at Community Missionary Baptist Church, where in a couple of hours I'll be moderating a town hall uh, being uh, featuring uh, State Representative Jasmine Crockett, who is running uh, for Congress. She is in a runoff against Jane Hamilton, uh, and so uh, I'll be uh, uh, moderating that town hall uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, tomorrow's show, Jane Hamilton will be on Roland Martin Unfiltered. 
Uh, as you see, yes, I did vote uh, today. My parents, they actually worked the polls. I was there. Uh, you have runoff races taking place uh, in the Democratic and Republican primary. The election is on Tuesday. Early voting ends on Friday. And so we are still in the midst of primary season. Uh, and, of course, we're also looking at what is taking place uh, across the country, a uh, number of primary races. We'll get to that in a second. But first, we want to talk about uh, Buffalo, uh, the continuing fallout uh, over the mass shooting of uh, the white domestic terror attack, which took place in Buffalo on Saturday. Ten people gunned down uh, in a Topps grocery store. Uh, folks, but one of the most disturbing things was took, took place when a woman called 911 uh, and was, true, was treated rudely and they hung up on her. She called into a local tele, a television station to describe what took place in the store uh, and how she was treated, uh, here is that particular exchange. What you saw this afternoon? I didn't really see much at all. I just heard the gunshots and just dropped down to the ground and just waited for him to stop. And he just wouldn't stop. So I tried to call 911 and I was whispering because I could hear him close by and when I whispered on the phone to 911, the, op, the dispatcher would start yelling at me, saying, why are you whispering? You don't have to whisper. And I'm trying to tell her, like, ma'am, he's in the store. He's shooting as an active shooter. I, I'm scared for my life. And she said something crazy to me, and then she hung up in my face. And I had to call my boyfriend and tell him to call 911. Hmm. Well, that is certainly unfortunate, Leticia. Um... Folks, uh, here, here's a statement from the Erie County uh, 911. So uh, here's the statement. Here's the statement. Here's the statement I'm reading right now. Erie County, uh, which runs a 911 communication center uh, through Central Public uh, Police Services, this is the statement that they actually released. Immediate action was taken, and the individual who took that call is now on administrative leave uh, pending a disciplinary uh, hearing, which should happen within a couple of weeks. Again, uh, on uh, leave. Um, uh, folks, talk about uh, absolutely crazy here. Um, seriously? And so uh, when you listen to that, she said that they hung up on her? Man, talk about absolutely uh, crazy. Now, uh, here's the deal. Uh, in New York State, unlike many other places, 911 calls are not publicly released uh, without a court order. So we have not been able to actually get the actual uh, 911 call. Uh, folks, it just, man, again, just makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, we're going to talk about that in our second with our panel. Uh, this also happened. Uh, a New York correctional officer has been suspended for literally making fun of the shooting. Um, uh, what, what happened was uh, he actually uh, made this post, sent out this post, uh, Gregory C. Foster, who is a corrections officer at the Attica Correctional Facility. Uh, this is what he posted. Too soon? This should weed out some of my Facebook friends. Yeah, yeah, they actually said that, okay? Uh, this is a statement that came from the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. Early this morning, DOCCS had been made aware of a despicable social media post by an employee of the department. The comments made by this correction officer are in violation of multiple department rules and will not be tolerated. This vile posting does not represent the morals and values of the thousands of staff members in the department. This indiv the individual responsible has been suspended without pay, and DOCCS will be seeking termination. The department has engaged the Civil Rights Task Force, which we are members of, for potential criminal prosecution. The, the department <coughs> also launched an internal investigation to identify and discipline any staff who may have engaged with the posting. Talk about absolutely crazy. My panel, A. Scott Bolden, former chair, National Bar Association, Political Action Committee, lawyer there in Washington, D.C., Robert Patillo. Uh, he is executive director of the Rainbow Push Coalition Peach Street Street Project, um, also an attorney, Monique Presley, legal analyst and host, uh, uh, of course, uh, joins us as well, crisis manager as well. All right, folks, let's just, uh, okay. I, I, I got to deal with this 911 call because... This woman says that the 911 was back here. Why are you whispering? And admonished her and hangs the phone up on her. I mean, look, I, I get you have procedures you got to go through. But, man, 
if what that woman described actually happened, Monique, that person to be fired so quickly, I mean, that is just sickening to think that that's how they, that this woman was treated by a 911 dispatcher. Right. I mean, and we hear these stories all the time. Um, it unfortunately is not rare. And I am not sure um, if there's any more information that's going to come out that would justify it. But from what it looks right, like right now, she, she should not be in that job. I, I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here, Robert, and, and, and I can only imagine this, 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 this white domestic terrorist is walking around shooting folks in the head with an AR-15, people are diving into coolers. They're hiding, trying to survive. And you call 911 and the dispatcher is going, why are you whispering, admonishing the woman and then hangs up on her? Well, you know, it comes down to a lack of training, lack of supervision, supervision, and a lack of vetting of people who have these jobs. Uh, we see these issues far too often, particularly in areas that are predominantly African American and minority. Uh, we're uh, not just hanging up on people, uh, where dispatchers take calls and then never actually send um, emergency care to the uh, the location, letting phones ring. Uh, very often, there's a lack of supervision, a lack of training in these uh, occupations, and a person like this should have never been hired, let alone be able to uh, stay in that job. And not only should she be fired, they should look up the entire chain of command to see who was supervising her, who's tracking her call logs, who's doing her performance reviews. How many other times has this happened? We know about this particular occasion, but what other crimes has this particular dispatcher or others who work with her uh, done these sorts of things? So I, I think you have to dig deep down into the system to find out where the actual rot begins. Don't simply cut off the surface level. Dig down in there and put in some systemic reform to prevent, prevent this from happening again in the future. Scott, uh, it, you would think that a 911 dispatcher has been trained that when somebody's calling up, it's a good bet they're not talking in my tone because they might be hiding. I mean, that's that's to me, that's sort of basic. Yeah, you know, uh, 911 support is not a job where you can have a bad day. Um, pilots can't have bad days. Police officers, to be honest with you, can't have bad days. And, the, and, the, and she's whispering because there's the shooter. But she could have been whispering because a burglar was in her house. And the 911 caller, remember the young kid who was 11 right, years old in right. the park? I'm saying, she's up. whispering. She's whispering. But, but again, I'm trying to yeah. demonstrate how important these, these, these calls that come in and I want are important. The kid that got killed in Cleveland, another dangerous piece, had to do with the call, the, the 911 dispatch, not giving the police all the details, that it might be a toy gun and so forth and so on, and the police show up and shoot him within four seconds. That's the police fault, but the call, the dispatch is also responsible. They can't have bad days, and whether they were trained or not, they've got to implement their training every day, because it's the first calm voice you hear, or should hear, when you're in trouble, or you're in danger, that voice has got to comfort you, but send help right away and get the details and send the details right away. That didn't happen here. And who knows how many people uh, were killed out of that 10 because that call didn't get handled properly. Uh, indeed. Now, yet on yesterday's show, uh, we talked with uh, attorney Ben Crump uh, and uh, one of the uh, family members of one of the folks who was killed. And they said they wanted to see uh, action from President Joe Biden, from Democrats in Congress. Well, today, uh, Democrats are moving uh, to actually uh, pass a bill that would establish offices around the country to deal with domestic terrorism. Uh, that's one of the things uh, that is happening. Uh, CBC members are also very active on this front, trying to take some legislative action uh, to deal with these type of shootings. Uh, today on the floor, uh, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, of the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, did not hold back, and she did uh, she did what President Biden wouldn't do. That is, she was specific in calling out Republicans for advancing the white supremacist replacement theory uh, conspiracy that this white domestic terrorist wrote about in his manifesto. This is what she had to say on the floor of the U.S. House today. Speaker, this Sunday in the state in which I was born and raised, New York. A man drove three hours and 200 miles 
to terrorize members of a local black community. This man shot 13 people, 11 of which were black. This was not a random act of violence. This was domestic terrorist attack, was an act of hate ignited by replacement theory rhetoric that is fueled by white supremacists, Fox News, and indeed some of my Republican colleagues. This false, ignorant, race-baiting theory called the Great Replacement has been used in multiple race-based domestic terrorist acts, including the synagogue attack in Pittsburgh and the El Paso shooting attack in 2019. There are a number of my Republican colleagues who spew this vile and venomous rhetoric. The silence of Republican leadership and their ranks in condemning this rhetoric that is not just ripping our country apart, but contributing to the death of Americans that, is, that shows that they are no longer the party of Lincoln or even the party of Ronald Reagan. I yield back. Well, that's exactly how you should do it. Um, that's exactly how you should do it, Robert Patillo. Um, again, people were talking about they want to see things happen. Uh, Democrats are, are trying to move in the House uh, to establish these domestic terror offices. Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, I think we have to dive a little bit deeper into great replacement theory uh, because people, for some reason, think this is a new idea. I, I first heard this from David Duke in 1988 when they started talking about uh, birth rates in the white community. This was after Reagan passed amnesty uh, in 1986. So the, the whole uh, concept is that the white race is not reproducing at a sufficient rate, not just here in America, but also in uh, Northern Europe, uh, to replace themselves generation over generation. And because of that, they are slowly dying out as a group. This is why during the Republican convention uh, in 2020, we kept hearing them talk about Western civilization, because it goes deeper than simply America. They are fighting for what they believe to be their legacy as white people on this planet. And if you look at the numbers, in 1960, white people made up 90 percent of the U.S. population. Uh, in the year 2000, they made up uh, right around 70 percent of the United States population. Um, the last census, they make up 57 percent of the U.S. population. And originally, people thought the singularity date when white people would become a, a no longer a majority was going to be in the 2040s, and now it's projected to be about 2036, when they will drop under 50% um, of the United States population. So almost all Republican policy over the last three decades has been based upon this conceptualization of slowing down this singularity event where they will no longer be the majority. Why are they fighting so hard to repeal abortion? Well, they need white women having more babies, and they can't have them having more babies, so they're out here on birth control and uh, having abortions. Why are they trying to build a border wall? Well, because when you're having 200,000, 300,000 immigrants coming to the country every month or so, uh, it speaks of that uh, pace of them um, of them uh, being dying out in this country. Uh, why do they fight so hard against African-American rights? Why do they do mass incarceration? Well, try to keep those population numbers down in the black community. For most of our lives, all of us on this panel, black folks have been between 13 and 15 percent of the population, not growing at the rate that was initially anticipated if you go back to some reports from the 1960s. So everything in Republican policy is based upon this idea. Indeed, the entire Cassia Belli of the GOP right now is in furtherance of this great replacement theory. It is not a friend's theory. Indeed, it is central to Republican Party politics and Republican Party policy. So when we talk about rooting this out, it's not simply a question of, well, let's get these racist and white supremacists and you know, the uh, these lunatics um, who go on shooting sprees and take care of them. We have to fundamentally carve it out of the American uh, body politic because it's caustic to everything that it touches because it's predicated on one singular idea, which is the survival of the white race here in America. And until we realize that and understand that and see how it dictates public policy, there's no way that we can properly address it. So, of course, we should be um, setting up these offices of domestic terrorism, but more so, each of these shootings should be taken out of the Department of Justice and put into the hands of the Department of Homeland Security. We should be investigating Charlottesville the same way we investigate al-Qaeda. We should be investing, uh, investigating Buffalo the same way we investigate ISIS, so we can find out who supplies these weapons, what chat rooms are they in, what are the commonalities, who are the deep pockets behind this? How deep does the organization go? And go in and break them down the same way we would break down a terrorist organization overseas. We have to do that right here in this country.
Well, part of the problem, Scott, is when you have that, which is one of the reasons why Representative Plaskett said what she said, when you have Republicans who just refuse to even say anything about it. The folks at Raw Story actually uh, questioned a couple of senators. Uh, one of them was Texas Senator John Cornyn. I I'm here in uh, my home state. Uh, mm -hmm. And what was interesting is this is what he said, quote, I think it's tragic. I don't know if you could call it a trend or not. Now, this is somebody who also who was on his way uh, to a closed door intelligence briefing. Now, keep in mind, you had the white supremacist attack that took place uh, in El Paso, 2019, 23 killed, 23 injured. We saw what happened in Charlottesville. We saw what happened January 6th. Keeping, then we also, of course, uh, saw what happened in Charleston, South Carolina at Mother right. Emanuel. We saw just what happened in Buffalo. And this is what he said. It's just a cop out trying to blame this on. I mean, it's violence committed by either criminal people or people who are deranged. Now, this is the former chief justice of the Texas Supreme Court, former <clears throat> attorney general, now United States senator. He said, and if people want to put that in a pigeonhole or category, whether it's hate crime or whatever, it doesn't make it any less evil. Now, Senator Ron Johnson, Republican from Wisconsin, this is oh, what God. he said. Um, uh, uh, he, he actually had a problem with the question itself. He said, quote, I think it's awful. I think it's grotes grotesquely uh, divisive. Okay. What it is, is the media's showing themselves for who they are, which are advocates for the radical left, and they're just trying to cover up for Biden now. Oh, who is Ron Johnson? The most recent chair of the U.S. Senate's Homeland Security Committee. This is why I keep saying, Scott, that if Democrats lose the, lose the Senate, these are the people who are going to be in control of the Senate. The pe if, they, if Democrats lose the House in November, you're going to have crazy, deranged Republicans who believe in the white supremacy view of replacement theory who are going to be in leadership in the U.S. House. That is what is at stake. Well, you, you're absolutely <laughs> right about that, but they sound like sympathizers and they can't see a hate crime in front of their face. And they don't want to see a hate crime in front of their face. You know, I wish I could cross-examine them on each of the cases that you just named, because what do you do when you find the racist manifestos that monitors and mimics the white supremacist manifestos, even with Trump and with those senators and even those who would support January 6th? The evidence is overwhelming. What do you do with a shooter in Baltimore who puts the N-word on the, on the length of his gun, he also has written a racist manifesto similar to white supremacists and shoots 10 black people, wounds a, or shoots at a white person and says, oh, I'm sorry, while he continues to go on his rampage. There is so much evidence that this was race-based. There is domestic terrorism, and it's domestic terrorism about for black people. Now, if they don't want to recognize that, and everything my colleague said is manifestly true, that it is all about keeping the numbers down, keeping white people in power. And while Ron Johnson and others may not be pointing guns and going on shooting rampages, they certainly sound like, when asked that question, they sound like they're conceptually sympathizing with the shooters of these race-based of, of race shootings. Why would they ever want to sound like that? It may be in their heart, but they're not pulling the trigger. That's bad. That's really bad. That ought to motivate Democrats in the White House to call them out, not, and, and not only that, but to win the races in the midterms. Oh, it, it gets better, Monique. Uh, this is also what Senator Johnson said, who is running for re-election in Wisconsin. Quote, we see gangs. We see cyber threats. I mean, I think there's actually more threatening threats. I mean, there's more serious threats facing the nation than what's posed by white supremacists. Now, again, I condemn it, obviously. I, I guess he forgot the FBI director saying the most uh, dangerous threat in America is white domestic terrorism. Oh, but then, of course, Ron Johnson had to go to the white Republican go-to crime in Chicago. 
He says, quote, now I'd be concerned about that. Again, a black on black crime in Chicago. Now I'd be concerned about that. Again, I'm concerned about all violence. But I mean, I would focus my attention on where the murders are actually occurring. As if we didn't see murders in Buffalo. This is what he said. And I'll be focusing my attention on what can, be we, what can we do to start preventing overdose deaths. Then, of course, there is the senior senator from Indiana, where this, this raw story uh, st st says it, that there are more than 15 white supremacist hate groups being tracked by the Southern Poverty Law Center in Indiana. Well, this is what good old boy Todd Young, Republican, had to say, Monique. Oh, gosh, I'll tell you what's on most Hoosiers' minds is inflation, border security, war in Europe. I think the president and our national Democratic leaders will be well served by finding some solutions to our most pressing challenges. Now, he, these no, he, are no, the Republicans. He's, he's right. Who, who he's will right. be in? Go ahead. He's, he's correct. That is what's on Hoosiers' minds. He, know, he knows his constituency, and they don't give a damn about us. They, well, no, they well, I, hold up. Um, That's on white Hoosiers' minds. I would think the, there are some the black folks in Indiana who probably care about the issue. Right. I mean, and we don't know how many black folks are actually part of his constituency um, and, and are voting for him and are responsible for keeping him in office. Money, money. Uh, but the he's a U.S. Money, money. He's a U.S. Money, money, money. He's a U.S. senator. All black people in Indiana are constituents of this guy. Oh, I Now, he may not care about them, saying. but they are constituents. I'm talking about who he's serving, who he cares mm -hmm. about, who he speaks for, who he's thinking about, and what they care about. And he spoke plainly about those issues. And they do not care about us. We are so dehumanized that when police kill us, it doesn't matter. We are so dehumanized that when the white supremacy and racism is in their faces and they cannot deny it, they'd rather compare and contrast and find issues that are more important than white supremacy. They'd rather find danger and threats that are more dangerous than what is happening to black people in the manner in which we're being targeted as citizens of this country. So when people like him tell the truth of their experience, their existence, their their work, um, and their issues. I, ju I just believe them. I take them right where they are. He meant what he said, and he said what he meant. And, and Roland, I, I want to talk about this what about Chicago argument that we always hear from uh, these people whenever we start talking about crime in the black community. Uh, we start talking about police brutality, white supremacy. The, the, all crime is terrible. Yes, we understand that. But there's a reason that we treat, let's say, uh, radical Islamic terrorism differently than two white guys fighting in the Chili's parking lot. It's because there's different ways that you handle and address them. These are organized events. So the same way that we go after al-Qaeda, that's the same way we have to go after white supremacy, because these are organized organizations. Do you really think an 18-year-old went out and bought all this equipment, body armor, front and back, level 3A, a tactical ballistic helmet, an AR-15 of multiple magazines, that tactical training and shooting was uh, and ordered all this stuff? Most of those things you can't even order before you're 18 years old. So clearly there's organizational backing behind what he was doing. They try to play this off as simply being one lone wolf crazy person who had a bad day, quote unquote. No, they, we need to find out and use all the tools that be in the uh, hands of the Department of Homeland Security to find out who he co-conspired with, who helped him write that 180-page manifesto, uh, what chat rooms was he in, what organizations was he part of. Find out where the rot begins. Don't simply take this at surface level. In the same way that we treat uh, terrorism differently than we treat white-on-white -white crime, that's why we treat white supremacy and white domestic terrorism different than black on black crime because the solution to both is different therefore you have to treat them differently so every time they do this what about ism I just simply say well then why exactly did we even have a war on terror all murder is bad murder so why should we even fight uh, terrorism overseas when you still have white on white crime here at home until we can take care of all white on white crime then we should not be addressing radical Islamic terrorism or anything else but the fact is they're simply using a canard in order to try to distract people from the fact that they know a big chunk of their constituency agrees with that shooter and that's why they never want to address it 
nor do they believe in racism. Well, and this is also... You sound surprised somehow... Oh, yeah, oh, no, they, 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 they don't think this exists. That. White people are afraid of the race question, racism, or that being the basis for anything in America, including critical race theory, that they don't want taught in the school. So I'm not surprised at that. They should be better, but they've never been victimized by racism. They don't even believe in racism. They take point by point until you get a George Floyd where they have no choice but to say that was police misconduct. Well, uh, let me remind people, sen in Wisconsin, Senator Ron Johnson uh, is running for re-election. You know what you should be doing? Booting his behind yep. out of office. All right, folks, <coughs> got to go to a break. We come back uh, more uh, of today's news as we're broadcasting here from uh, Cedar Hill, Texas, uh, where in about 90 minutes I'll be hosting uh, a town hall with state, Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett, who is uh, in a re-elect, excuse me, in a runoff battle uh, to replace uh, longtime Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson uh, here uh, in Texas. We'll be right back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie. Summertime when the living is easy, or is it? Summer vacations, class reunions, kids in summer camp, all fun, but stressful. You need to get into a summer mindset and have a plan. Oh yes, our panel gives us their favorite summer planning hacks. On a next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie here at Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Teresa Griffin. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, as I said, I'm here uh, in Texas where there are a, well, the runoff elections uh, from the uh, primary uh, taking place on Tuesday. Last night across the country, uh, there were primaries uh, in a number of states, uh, of course, uh, Kentucky, North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Nebraska as well, Idaho, Oregon, all across uh, the country. Uh, in North Carolina, former uh, Supreme Court Justice Sherry Beasley, African-American woman, she won the Democratic nomination for the United States Senate. Uh, she is going to face off against Republican nominee Ted Budd, who beat uh, the former governor uh, by 30 points uh, for that. There'll be, of course, Budd has been already been endorsed uh, by Donald Trump. Uh, and so that is going to be uh, a critical race that we're looking at. Uh, it's going to be a tight race. Uh, bottom line is Beasley can win, but it's going to take uh, a significant turnout, especially when it comes to rural North Carolina. Uh, May 24th, uh, of course, that's uh, six days from now. Uh, Beasley will be on Roland Martin Unfiltered. We'll be talking about her race uh, in uh, now also. Uh, there in North Carolina, uh, Don Davis beat Erica Smith uh, for one of the congressional seats there. Uh, of course, we had Erica Smith uh, on the show. Uh, he was endorsed by uh, retiring Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Uh, and so uh, he goes on. Remember, Republicans changed that district. It is not a solid Democrat district, uh, but it's also going to be a tough race uh, as well. Uh, in uh, Kentucky, Charles Booker, remember he ran against a couple of years ago against Mitch McConnell? Well, he's back. Uh, he won a Democratic nomination. He is going to be facing uh, Senator Rand Paul in Kentucky. Here's the deal, folks. Only 20 percent, only 20.7 percent of all Kentucky residents voted in the primary. Don't think Booker 
uh, uh, can't beat Paul. It's about driving the ground game. That's going to be critical uh, in that race as well. Let's go to Pennsylvania, where Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman won the Democratic nomination over Congressman, uh, Congressman Connor Lamb and also Pennsylvania State Representative uh, Malcolm Kenyatta. Of course, uh, uh, Fetterman, uh, remember, uh, suffered a stroke on Friday, also had a pacemaker installed as well. Uh, and so he does not know who is he going to be facing because it is an extremely tight race on the Democratic side uh, where uh, Dr. Mehmet Oz uh, is uh, slightly leading, slightly leading in that race. And so uh, we'll see exactly uh, what's going to happen there. Uh, but uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Austin Davis won the Democratic nomination for lieutenant governor. He's a brother. Uh, he is going to be running on the ticket with Josh Shapiro, the Democratic candidate for governor, uh, who he also endorsed Davis in early January. If successful, Davis would become the Pennsylvania's uh, first black lieutenant governor if he won in the fall. Now, uh, folks, y'all need, need to pull this photo up. I don't know why we don't, we don't have it here. Um, there was a congressional race, the Pennsylvania 12th, and everybody was paying attention to. And that is, uh, you had uh, this young sister. Uh, she's a state representative. Her name is Summer Lee. Uh, and folks, APEC dropped $3.3 million. There are various, uh, various uh, political action committees to stop her from winning. Well, guess what? It didn't work. It failed. Summer Lee uh, has won that, that Democratic nomination by about 400 votes. Uh, she is a progressive. She was supported uh, by uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, and again, she was she worked the ground. Uh, she had a very, very uh, strong, uh, strong message. Uh, and in a second, we're going to play uh, exactly uh, her speech uh, from last night uh, where she addressed her supporters, folks, uh, to the control. Y'all should uh, look up. I uh, just, just posted it. Uh, and again, this is uh, an important race because this is what folks were told. In fact, not just this race, uh, you had a moderate Republican who was in or Oregon. He got blown out by a progressive challenger. You saw in North Carolina, progressive district attorneys, they still were able to win. And in fact, uh, Mondale Robinson uh, is a brother uh, who uh, worked with, uh, uh, of course, uh, Black Men a Voting Initiative. Uh, he actually um, hit me up. Um, he sent me a text. Just give me one second, y'all. Let me find it. So Mondale Robinson ran for mayor uh, in Enfield, North Carolina, uh, a rural town there. He was running against an incumbent. He ran as a strong progressive. This is what he tweeted me a couple of hours ago. I did it. I defeated an incumbent by 50 percentage points and got 76 percent of the vote. I outperformed everyone on the ballot. No candidate running for any office in North Carolina outperformed me with infield voters. He said, I'm telling the world that you can be as progressive in the rural black South as you can anywhere. And it's a better way to turn out low propensity, sporadic voters. Um, in some of the other states as well, uh, we saw uh, the exact same thing. Bottom line here, uh, Robert, uh, all of the folks who have been saying that, look, progressives, look, you got to run different. Uh, we, we, we have seen where folks actually are winning. Now, yeah, now you have, of course, moderate still winning. And yes, this is the primary. But the reality is this here. If you look at that race, Summer Lee is a perfect example. That sister, they put the work on the ground. They didn't sit here and bombard the airways with television ads. You can only buy so much TV and folks just start tuning it out. I'm telling you, what these candidates should be doing is telling, I'm in the church, I ain't going to cuss, but they should be telling these Democratic strategists to go to hell by always trying to put money in television. If you put money on the ground and turn people out and reach the low propensity voters who align with your values, you can beat these Republicans in November. You're absolutely right, Roland. I think that this is the problem that we've had with the DCCC, with the Democratic National Committee. They still want to be kingmakers. They still want to have the power behind the curtain. They still want to be able to tell people who the candidates are going to be. Back in 2009, I was running the attorney general's race here in Georgia for Ken Hodges. Uh, shout out to everybody on the campaign who's now you know, old now. But um, from the attorney general's spot, we did a 159-county grassroots strategy, knocking on doors all the way down in Oglethorpe, up in Hart County. 
County, all around the places where they tell you that Democrats aren't supposed to be out knocking on doors and uh, looking for voters. We got more votes from the attorney general spot than the lieutenant governor or the governor got during that primary. So the grassroots work works. What it takes is people willing to actually hire a local strategist. Quit flying in people from D.C. and New York and L.A. to run your campaign in Lowndes County, Alabama. Get people who know the grassroots, know the ground. And this idea that progressives can't win is a pernicious lie that's been created by the kingmakers and the, uh, the party politics. President Trump blew all that up. He blew up the entire concept of having to run to the middle, of having to be this um, kind of new, neutral candidate that can appeal to both sides. We are in a tribalistic um, campaign season right now. You see the, the campaign right there in Pennsylvania, where you have three candidates running. One was running as being crazy, one was running being crazy as hell, and then one was running as being crazy as all hell. They are not trying to get moderate votes in the middle. So when you're running as, uh, as a progressive, you have to run on that agenda. They got 81 million votes in 2020, make the promises, bring them through on the local level, and that's how you win, not by being this kind of blank canvas, white guy with brown hair smiling in a cornfield with a dog uh, that campaigns used to be. You have to actually have motivate voters and get out there, bring them to the polls, get them motivated, and tell them exactly why they need to vote for you, and you can win if you do so. You know, th th this this is the thing that, that, that as I'm looking at here, um, um, Monique, again, here we are six months out. Uh, and, and the reality in a lot of these campaigns, uh, what you often see is you see uh, this intense focus on, again, television ads and, and oh, uh, let's appeal to the independent voters. Bottom line is this here. You go after the people who you likely can get out. When I was in Kansas City last week, they were talking about how their goal uh, is to get 40,000 people, is to get 40,000 people um, uh, focused, uh, and that is uh, to, uh, to, to try to get local control of their police department. And again, that's just old school politics, is looking at the numbers, is studying the precincts, is looking at where the turnout was, where's the best turnout, who are your likely voters. And, and it happens every year. And look, I, yeah, you could call me being selfish. It also means putting the money in black newspapers, in Latino newspapers, uh, utilizing uh, grassroots organizations. When you have these strategists who, frankly, you know what? They really don't care if they win or lose because they're going to keep getting their checks. Bottom line is this here. You've got to put the money on the ground to turn your voters out. And I really hope, I really hope uh, some Democrats who are running are looking at what Summer Lee did and say, how did you beat back $3.3 million of APAC money flooding into that particular district? I mean, and I think that's why organizations like Black Voters Matter are so successful and why people who have any sense of supporting them and supporting their endeavors as they're running these campaigns. Um, um, those of us who have been around campaigns for a long time, like Robert, like me, like Scott, we know that the ground game really is the only game. Uh, and so while there is, as Latasha Brown always says, you can't out-organize voter suppression, there are still methods and mechanisms that you can use to win in a fair fight. And that's what we saw happen. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Roland, um, um, again... Uh, again, as I, as I look at I look at a lot of these races, and again, I, I spent a lot of time last night. I spent time last night just uh, looking at a lot of local races, looking at uh, looking at uh, DA races, looking at some state representative races, and the races where where you have these strong progressive voices, they were outgunned, they were outspent, they were outraised, but they were not out hustled. Yeah, but that's true, and. Um... It's all about the ground game. It's all about get out the vote. You know, Mary Barry used to say uh, to me when I represented him before he passed on uh, with the aim we got his wings, he used to say it's called political science. There's a science to politics. There's a science to campaigning. And everything you said about the ground game and getting in black newspapers and human uh, touch and, and touching voters and counting those voters. He used to put, he used to have these cards. Whoever he knocked on the door or his people knocked on the door, they got their name, address, were they a super voter or not, and he kept those cards. By the time his campaign came around, he knew how many votes he needed to win. He knew where those votes were going to come from. And on Election Day, it was about implementation. 
Did you have the money for buses? And each bus leader on, on his campaign had those cars that they have taken in interviewing super voters and, and general voters across the city, across the District of Columbia. And so by the time Election Day came, he was counting votes, and when they would turn in those cards, he would know or have a good idea how many votes he got out of Ward 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. He would know that already. And so he would go into election night after the polls closed with a really good idea of where he had gotten his votes from, what the number was, and then whether he was going to win or not. That's political science, and that's what you're talking about. And Roland, on, on that same point, well, and, just and, a little... And here's what's, what's crazy, uh, Monique. You can actually see who voted and who didn't. I mean, you, you can yeah. literally, you can yeah. literally go, you can put, they will have the data, and it says, these are the registered voters, these are people who actually voted in this precinct. And so, if you've got a precinct of 800 voters and 60 voted in the last election, I'm just saying, that's what knocking on those doors, that's what touching them, that's what going to them. And again, we see Sherry Beasley, again, who was the U.S. Senate candidate, she lost, she lost as the Chief Justice of North Carolina Supreme Court by 400 votes. That's statewide in North Carolina. She lost by 400 votes. Look, this race, in the Senate race, uh, I think it's now down, I think uh, Oz's lead is down to 1,500 or 1,400, uh, is actually going down. Summer Lee won her race by, by, by around 400 or 500 votes. Every vote matters, but in, in, in this, this insane idea, because we saw this in Georgia, and I want Robert to speak to this after Monique, where, look, there was no more TV time to buy. There was no more TV time. They were sitting on millions of dollars of the Ossoff and Warnock campaign, and the Dem Democratic strategists were thinking, let's just buy more radio and more TV. It's like, yo, you're, you, you, you're not going to all, you're not going to just win by blanketing the airwaves. You've got to touch the people. And I say, if, if Democrats want to hold to the House and hold the Senate, they better be going and find those low propensity, high turnout voters that Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign have been talking about consistently over the last several years. Monique, then Robert. Right. I mean, there's no mystery to it. As you pointed out, we know exactly who they are. We know where they are. We know what the voting patterns are. All that information is available for what you need in order to have a successful ground game as foot soldiers. And that's where what we're always saying on the show actually comes in. Every single person can participate. Every single person does matter, not just with your vote, but with your willingness to volunteer to get out the vote. And there is something that everyone can do. I've said before on this show, I'll say again, I was probably 10, 11. First campaign I was associated with was for Governor Ann Richards. I've been hooked ever since, but I was walking door to door. I was sticking, asking people permission to put signs in their yards. That stuff still matters. It still matters. And people still appreciate who would not have voted this time around will appreciate somebody asking them, can I talk to you about what would make a difference in your vote? Are you planning on voting in this election? What are your issues in vote for this election? I would like to have your vote. Here's what I plan to do. What can I do better? I mean, that's that's person to person. If you're in it to serve somebody, then you ought to actually care about the people you're trying to serve. And and Monique's absolutely uh, right. And you know, Robert, uh, Robert, you know, Robert, you know, Robert, Robert, uh, Robert I, uh, I want you to comment, but on that point, Monique made when about yard signs. I mean, it's crazy how all of these newfangled candidate campaigns, oh, that's old politics. We've now got our uh, phones and we've got our iPad, our algorithm. In 2016, voters in Michigan and Pennsylvania were calling Hillary Clinton's offices going, where are the yard signs? We're driving all around and all we're seeing are Trump signs. And, and, and literally the Clinton campaign was like, oh, oh, that's old politics. We don't need that. And they were like, no. It, seeing yard signs builds momentum, gives you a feeling that things are building. And so all of these, are, and I'm telling, look, look, y'all, y'all know I'm a techie, okay? Again, I got two phones, three iPads, an Apple computer, but at the end of the day, politics is still basic. I need to get one more vote than you. You better use right. every advantage you can, whether that's technical, with digital, 
yard signs, flyers, I don't care, pigeons, take your pick. Everything that you can use, that's what you better use. And hey, look, Roland, uh, this, a lot of this comes out of the DNC campaign school for, that started right after the Obama campaign. So I, I always go to those DNC campaign schools, and they let the nerds take over. And just as you said, the, the particularly younger candidates, and this is a segment I'm going to call Free Game with Attorney Robert Petillo, uh, you cannot win a campaign on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook ads, so on and so forth. That's a part of it. That is a tool. That is not the totality of the right, tool. Right, right. You're not going to... You're not going to win elections going to cocktail parties and fundraisers and meeting greets. You're going to have to go to those old folks' homes and the senior high-rises. You're going to have to go not door-to-door -door yep, yep. counties you don't want to go to. You're going to have to actually wear your shoes down to the point you have to get a new pair because you put a hole in them. You actually have to have a ground team that can go door-to-door -door because particularly in uh, uh, local and municipal races, you can actually have the names and phone numbers of every single vote that you need to win before election day, and then on election day, you can just simply call through those lists to make sure that your voters are turning out on election day to vote for you. Let's say you're in a district where you need 1,500 votes to win. You can call 1,500 people with a team of five folks in one day to get them out to the polls. So put the actual work in. Quit trying to outsource it. Quit trying to use vote builder and algorithms and think you're going to outsmart the system. It's still going to come down to who works the hardest, and that's what it takes to win. Yeah, and Roland, real quick. Well, you know, Scott, you know, you know, you know, you know Scott, one of the things that, you know, Scott, one of the, Scott, one second, Scott, one second. Uh, one of the things that, that Robert just laid out there, again, uh, about getting back to basics, when you talk about uh, that, 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 that old shoe leather, again, what Reverend Barber has consistently talked about is that there are people, low, low income, poor workers, they actually represent more than 90 million voters. He said, if Democrats literally, literally turned out, bumped, uh, bumped that number by 5%, they win. But you've got to be willing to actually talk to those voters. And that's why, hey, I'm tired. All these Democrats, you know, the ones who were whining and complaining, oh, my God, we didn't win because defund the police. Well, there were actually some people who won in purple districts uh, who, who still won because of that. In spite of that, the bottom line is this here. What are you saying to voters? And you know what? It's a whole bunch of lazy politicians who get outworked. OK, and they're used to just doing the minimum. And so they should be studying a Cory Bush. Uh, AOC, studying Ayanna Presley, studying these newer members to say, hey, how are you putting the new with the old? The people who whine, oh my God, I, I lost my position, it's likely they got outworked. Yeah, you still gotta hit, you still gotta hit the ground. Those yard signs, what's important about those yard signs is the more yard signs you see, people believe that you're gonna win. And why do they believe that? Because if you're a voter and you're willing to put a yard sign and tell the world that you're voting for Hillary Clinton or voting for Cory Bush, people are going to believe you. And if they're in their neighborhood, they're going to believe you. And then you're really to go public. You're going to tell the world who you're going to vote for. That's just powerful. But you got to go get those other voters. If you're down in the poll, because most polls will poll super voters, right? That's voters that vote in every race. That's people on this, on this uh, show right now. But there are a lot of people who aren't touched because they can't talk about the issue. You go touch them, you listen to them, you get a commitment for their vote, this might be the first time. That 90 million Reverend Barber we're talking about, that might be the first time a candidate or somebody in the campaign knocked on their door, registered them to vote, and listened to what the issues are they're facing, whether you're in rural Georgia or rural North Carolina or the suburbs of Chicago. It may be the first time. Because they're not super voters. You gotta go get them. There's a big ass pool of voters, as you said, that have never voted or don't vote all the time, and ain't nobody asked them to vote. Go get them. You ain't gotta have 50 50 in the Senate. Just go get them. But that takes work and commitment, uh, Roland. That takes work and commitment, boy. You gotta have volunteers. You gotta blanket that junk. And you know what? You're right. A lot of politicians well, don't have the money to do I, it, I also, but they don't have the commitment. I, I, well, and then look, I also don't buy 
I, I saw this um, piece earlier today by Jake Sherman. He's like, oh, the Democrats are getting destroyed across the country. And I'm going, um, what election were you watching last night? See, one of the things that happens, Monique, this becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, because I've literally seen where Democrats have picked up seats that were actually red seats. This is real simple. If you all these people in D.C. who keep saying, oh, they're going to lose, going to lose, y'all ain't on the ground. Y'all aren't going to these places. You know this. You've been out there with Cliff and Latasha and Black Voters Matter. Well, they have been going to these small towns with food and other different things, talking to people. Look, Joe Madison says it all the time. You got to put it where the ghost can get it. You ain't going to win nothing sitting your behind at home. You are going to have to go out there and get them. And I'm telling you right now, I do not accept this worldview that, oh, my goodness, it's going to be a colossal tsunami. It will be a tsunami. And yes, the numbers are there. The Republican enthusiasm is high because these MAGA people, that's how primaries actually work. It's really your hardcore people. But here's the deal. It's May 6th. It's May 18th. And if your primary is already over, you better be in hardcore general election mode. You better be having the town halls like we're about to have here uh, in uh, in an hour. You better be doing things in your in these cities, in these states, going after the voters, not trying to go after the mythical Republican white woman in the suburbs who you ain't going to flip. You better go after that, that 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 low income worker and speak to them about what you've done and what you are going to do. I don't believe this notion that Democrats are going to get wiped out. They will get wiped out if they don't work for people's vote. Monique, final comment before I go to break. Well, absolutely. And that's one of the things, you know, we had a president who was a, a skilled master organizer, a community organizer, and that is what is necessary to get this done. People say the reason why they don't go to certain communities is because those communities don't vote. But if you go into communities, they say, we don't vote because nobody cares to come in here and talk to us. So it becomes this right. crazy circle and cycle that that the people who care about these elections have to break. I, I was talking to some people in Memphis, Tennessee last night, and they told me what their concerns were. And these were lawyers, black lawyers. And they said, we're concerned about low turnout in our primaries. We're concerned about our at-risk neighborhoods. And we want vehicles to be able to increase turnout, early turnout for our voters there, and for them to know that it matters that they vote. So these candidates... That's what they have to do. And it's not as scary as you think. You ain't got to wander off into the Bronx by yourself. The goal of organizing is to turn leaders in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then those leaders walk you in to that community. They go door to door with you. You have to get somebody to give you an okay in that area. When I first started going to door to door, I was going from 50 to 55th Street. I knew everybody by name. That's why that was my neighborhood. And that's the way that it has to keep happening. We need to get workers in our communities. And that means that somebody who's in high places has to see the necessity of the common touch. Uh, before I go to break, I will say this here. Uh, President Obama was good at him getting votes. He was awful when it came to his party. Now, I mean, I, I, I understand hey, your point. Well, that, that but, wasn't the job. Uh, I was talking trust about hey, hey, Roman, being skilled Roman. organizers. No, I, 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 actually, actually, it was, actually, it was the job, but uh, his DNC uh, was awful. But, oh, uh, Roland, his DNC was awful. Roland, just one point on what Monique No, actually, they could they could have replicated. No, hold up, hold up, Robert, hold up. They, hold up, Robert. They could have replicated I know you're about to if talk about they the didn't money. strip Good everything luck. out of the DNC and go to and go to Good no 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 they want the money they stripped everything out of DNC and sent to Obama for America OFA OFA was one of the biggest mistakes uh, that and, 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 and individuals who were in his administration even told me that that was a big mistake but that's the past okay, Robert go ahead to final comment now. and I got to go to this year's votes this year's votes. Well, this, this one, I got you, but, but no, but no, Democrats you referenced the past. Nothing. I had to go ahead and go there. Robert, go ahead. Look, just, just Robert, go ahead. Big, 
thinking back on what Monique said, I, I tell this to people who ask me about running for office all the time, and they say, well, what about going to XYZ neighborhood, XYZ community, it's a dangerous. If you're scared to go into a neighborhood, how the hell are you going to represent those people? So maybe you shouldn't be running if you're scared to go to certain parts of your district or you're not welcome there. So if you, if you can't go talk to those people, you can't represent them, maybe you should find another hobby to get into. Politics ain't to be cute. It's not Hollywood for ugly people. It's for servants, not for people who want to just be on TV. All right. Hey, folks, got to go to a break. Uh, we come back. We're going to talk with Lacey Leonard. Man, just what the, what the brothers, what he is going through, his wife is holding it down. But uh, just unbelievable what this former NFL player is going through when it comes to his health. Uh, we'll tell you what's the latest thing that happened. All right. It's 3,000 of y'all watching on YouTube right now. How we got 650 likes? We should have 3,000 likes by now. Every single person who's watching on YouTube, y'all need to hit the doggone like button right now. So when I come back from this break, I should see a bare minimum 1,500 likes. I really should see 2,000 likes. Well, hit the doggone like button y'all uh, on facebook do the same thing are uh, we actually on facebook today so they were blocking us on yesterday uh and so uh if y'all on facebook hit the like hit the share button as well folks if y'all want to support what we do please we want to hit 50,000 downloads of the black star network app and so please uh download the app apple phone android phone apple tv android tv uh roku amazon fire tv xbox one samsung smart tv if you want to support us your dollars make it possible for us to travel to come places like this here to come Cover stores around the country. We plan on hitting the ground, uh, and we also expect these campaigns to spend money uh, on black on me, like they're gonna spend on these local TV stations and radio stations. But if y'all want to support us, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send checks and money orders to PO Box five seven one nine six, Washington D.C. two zero zero three seven dash zero one nine six. Cash app is dollar sign R M unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin unfiltered. Venmo is R M unfiltered. Zelle is Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back here in Cedar Hill, Texas on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We welcome you to the launch of the Mass Poor People's Low Wage Assembly and Mara March on Washington, D.C., June 18, 2022. We are a new the compelling power that we, poor and low-income people, have to reconstruct society from the bottom up. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. Because we know that there is no scarcity in this land. The only scarcity is the moral will to do what's right. Oh, those with sub-minimum wage jobs who can't afford sky-high rent. People with disabilities are the fastest growing minority group. It's crazy to me that in 2021, it's still legal for workplaces to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. There are still so much trial and tribulations that we go through as indigenous people. We can't get a decent wage to sustain ourselves, nor can we get adequate housing. Veterans across this nation say enough is enough. We can't pat essential workers on the back on one day and then cut their health care the next day. Health is a political choice. What more do I need to do to prove that my voice is just as valuable as anyone else's? There are still forces in denial that would try to slow walk our transition to a clean economy and a just future for us all. We have an immoral system run by moral people. But together we walk, and we walk and we fight. It's time for a change. Reconstruyamos esta gran nación. See, we are people of resilience as we fight these interlocking injustices together. When we work together, mobilize together, and rise together, we become a voice for the voiceless, and we become an agent of change in a time where great change is needed. We need the third reconstruction to ensure that deaf people 
people with disabilities and all people can have the right to live and to thrive. We know what they are doing, but the question is, what are we going to do? Reconstruction begins when we change our mentality and say it's time for you to get your foot off of my neck. Hey, yo, peace world. What's going on? It's the love king of R&B, Raheem Devon, and you're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, we've told you on numerous times, uh, we've told you numerous times uh, the, the, the trials and tribulations that former NFL player Lewis Leonard uh, has been going through when it comes to uh, his health. His wife, Lacey, uh, has also uh, uh, been with us as well. Uh, they, they recently posted some video uh, that, was, that was just shocking on, on social media on how uh, he was treated uh, literally cops moving him out of the hospital. Uh, this was the video that was posted. We saw it uh, and we reached out to both of them. Uh, they join us right now for Phoenix, uh, Lacey and Lewis. Uh, glad to have y'all back. Uh, hate to do it, have you back on these circumstances. What happened this time? Well, uh, essentially, Lewis was in the hospital. He had been in the hospital for a little over about two weeks, um, sorry, a little over two weeks. And oh, it started off, he had went in, of course, like his gout had flared up really bad and he was dealing with a lot of inflammation, a lot of pain. Um, they ended up admitting Lewis. He was there for about a week. And then last Monday, um, he had an accident, uh, in the restroom of his hospital bedroom where he sat um, on, what would you say, like a metal pole? Yeah, what it, what it, what, what it was, Roland, is um, uh, one of the nurses left the uh, a sprout down that actually rinses out urinals. Um, they post a pit, they post to put them up and they actually left it down and I went in to use the restroom um, and actually sat on that metal uh, uh, sprout and um, sad to say uh, it was um, it entered my my rear end um, and uh, from there. Just a lack excessive, of excessive, excessive, excessive. I mean, you could think about the pain, but I mean, I'm talking about blood everywhere, you know, just a bad situation. And um, from then on, uh, the hospital did not um, give me any x-rays, did not give me any imaging to kind of see what was going on. Um, we asked for this for numerous days. So uh, all the way in, I, this happened on Monday the, the 9th. Um, they kicked me out the hospital on Friday, uh, Friday the thirteenth. Um, from Monday to Friday. Oh, wait, 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 hold up. They they threat. Wait, 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 wait. They threatened to kick you out of the hospital. No, they didn't threaten. You they kicked me out. Got injured. They kicked me so, out. Wait, wait, wait. So, you get so after you, I, get, you after get, I injured got injured because they made, I, they screwed up. Yeah, after I got injured and it was negligence on the nurse on the nurse's behalf, because the nurse is supposed to pick the sprout up. Um, whenever they go to do what they got to do, they're supposed to pick it up. She, she failed to do that. Um, I got injured, and it was, I mean, I got i got pictures and videos, and it's some of the, like, the worst thing you can see when you talk about 
uh, blood and 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 waste. You know, it was. He was already a, a bad well, experience. He was already not even really mobile. He was in a walker, so he was already considered a fall risk. So he really probably shouldn't have been in there by himself trying to use the restroom, anyways. But that's neither here nor there. When he had the injury and I expressed to them that, hey, you know, what's our plan of care at this point? Because he had already been in and was almost to recovery until that incident happened. Uh, unfortunately, they're just kind of very dismissive. You know, some of the nurses in their reports, they said, oh, well, we it didn't interact rectally. And I'm like, well, if he, I'm sure he understands if something entered rectally. Is there any way we can get, you know, some scans done? That never happened. Um, I did ask for an incident report to be written just for his records, and if something was to happen later down the line, we can make sure that he, we had some type of paper trail of what he might possibly be dealing with. Um, I was informed that an incident report was done after I requested it, but I think being that I did request it, I think the hospital was already very like, we got to get this guy out of here. And so from there, it just kind of escalated with you know, them not giving him any type of pain medication, uh, you know, not he was requesting doctors, doctors really not being, um, you know, communicating with him as far as like what was going on. And then what led to him being uh, essentially kicked out of the hospital at four o'clock in the morning when I got the call was one of the hospital directors in Lewis um, had a conversation and this particular director had informed Lewis you know, basically, you've you violated a behavioral contract, so we're kicking you out. Lewis had not signed no behavioral contract. Lewis had not gotten no type of altercation with nobody at that hospital. Lewis was not aggressive. Lewis could barely walk. He couldn't walk at all. I mean, he's in there in a walker, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, they essentially told him, you have to leave. And when Lewis was saying, I'm not... I'm not going to be able to go anywhere. I can't even move. They, they, that's when they threatened with the police. And Lewis was like, okay, well, you're going to have to do what you have to do, but I can't even move. And I guess they called Phoenix PD. And Phoenix PD came deep, as you can see in the videos, which I've never experienced anything like that in my life. I was terrified because by default, Lewis is 6'5", over 400 pounds. He's, he looks aggressive. America, by America standards, he's a oversized black male and you're aggressive. So I was scared for his life because I didn't know what these police were going to do. They were threatening, like, if you don't, you know, cooperate, we will take you to jail. You know, they even offered to take him in a police car to the hospital. And I'm like, wait, what? The hospital wouldn't even offer him a transfer to another hospital. And I'm like, okay, if you guys decide that you're, you're not going to provide him care, why would you not transfer this this patient to another hospital and they failed to do that. And so it just, to me was really disgusting because I know they wouldn't have done somebody that looked like them like this, you know, Lewis was not no threat. He could not have harmed anybody. And the fact that even on their discharge paperwork, they, it, he wasn't discharged because they said he was healthy. They discharged him because they said he violated their, uh, I guess some type of behavioral contract, which, which came out to being that, Lewis that is just... nurses in his room. And he, he told a nurse in particular, I just want to let you know for my safety, I am recording. And then that nurse then told the director and that director said, okay, he's out of here. He, I think they were just frustrated. And anybody that works in healthcare, you are going to be frustrated with patients. Some of these patients are right. dealing with physically, mentally. That's something I had even expressed to this hospital the week prior and everything was just kind of left to the wayside. So I just, it was something I had never seen in my life. I was just totally just disgusted by it. Honestly, racial disparity in healthcare well, is we a did thing. Reach out to the yeah, we did reach out to the hospital and I uh, have not, uh, of course, gotten a comment from them. Uh, we hate that uh, y'all had to go through this, uh, but we do appreciate uh, you sharing your story with us. Uh, Lacey, thank you so very much. Lewis, thank you so very much. Lewis, I, I, I can't tell. Are you wearing Omega hat on my show? See, there you go. See, I know. I know see, I know. I, I know the serious subject.
Look at the monitor. I say it as he ran away on my show. Hey, I thought I told you about I that last. I, I appreciate you, man, because you always tend to put a smile on my face. <laughs> so I well, appreciate it. Well, I always, I, I, we, we talk we talk about some serious stuff, and so I, I always I say, you know what? I said I, I always got to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, Lacey, next time if he wear that purple and gold, go ahead and just snatch that off his head. All right, y'all, y'all take care. We we'll be praying for you, Doc. Uh, Thank and, you. Uh, Thank keep you. Uh, uh, what happens? Y'all, y'all take care. We surely appreciate. It. Thanks a bunch. Uh, Thank you. Thank you again, folks. Uh, uh, it's uh, now people need to understand. I, I, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, and one of the reasons why uh, we, we we continually have Lacey and Lewis on here is because I mean, a lot of people need to understand. People watch NFL, they watch sports, they watch college football, uh, but they never see what life is like after that, or what these families deal with uh, in terms of uh, these health issues. Uh, some breaking news uh, just coming in: uh, President Joe Biden is in. Uh, they said they lost my mic. Hey, y'all, do y'all still hear me? Okay, you hear me now. Got it. Uh, again, some breaking news here. President Joe Biden is invoking the Defense Production Act to address the nationwide nationwide shortage of baby baby formula. The part of the problem here is that only four four country four companies essentially dominate baby formula in America. One of the things, though, uh, Monique, uh, that and Democrats have done an awful job with this. Donald Trump actually, by opposing NAFTA and whatever the heck that new thing he called it, he actually made it difficult to be able to import baby formula for Canada from Canada. And so that's actually exacerbated the problem uh, the FDA took um, one of Abbott's uh, manufacturing facilities offline because they had contaminated baby formula. This is what happens in a country when you only have four companies that are dominating a market. If one goes down, you're absolutely screwed. Uh, and so we've seen all of these different stories, Republicans blaming uh, the baby formula problem uh, on President Joe Biden. No, blame it on the companies who screwed up, who were actually sending out uh, a baby formula that was actually making kids sick. Absolutely. Blame it. Blame it on them. Uh, blame it on the prior president because of making it much harder for us to access imports uh, that are necessary. Um, but it also, Roland, I want to point out, it, it, it further highlights the disparities uh, that exist when anything goes wrong. It affects our community disproportionately more so and worse than others. So, for instance, there was all this information going around saying, ladies, if you need formula, just go on Amazon, click from your United States um, to Canada and go ahead and order and it will come to your door. And you know what? That worked. That worked for people who have Amazon, have Amazon Prime, people who have Wi-Fi service, people who are not on government assistance, who don't have WIC, or SNAP because you cannot use online purchasing for items for that. So there, there are a lot of issues that people don't necessarily understand who are not dealing with this, this part of their lives anymore. I was just thinking earlier today how freaked out I would have been if I had young children um, during a time like this. I was fortunate enough to be able to nurse mine, but then in the transition from nursing to regular milk, being supplementing with some formula in the middle, and it is a, it is there's nothing scarier um, for a mom than not being able to provide pop, proper nourishment uh, for a baby and to hear a crying, hungry baby, and that is something that should never happen in the United States for any child. This is the thing that to me is crazy. Look, I. That's crazy. I, I, I don't understand how, if you are the, the administration, you allow uh, folks to somehow blame you for a problem you have nothing to do with, uh, Scott. Uh, and, and, and this is where you say, no, it's the idiot, all of you idiots who voted for uh, tossing out NAFTA and then approving that, whatever that crap d Trump passed, that's what made it difficult. You put the blame exactly where it, where it is. And again, the other issue 
m monopolies in this country. Four mm -hmm. companies control 90% of the baby formula in America. Anything happens with one of those companies, it's a massive crisis in this country. And this is the problem with, with monopolies. You, you're at, here's, here's the other problem, though. Watch this. Under Trump, they let that company, that factory, shut down appropriately because of the formula. But they did nothing. The regulators did nothing under these circumstances where 90 percent is covered by those four companies. They did nothing to get that factory back up and running on a timely basis in case we hit this shortage, whether it was during COVID or pre-COVID, it didn't matter. Their administration did that. Had that factory been back up and running on a timely basis, it's, more, it's likely that you wouldn't have this uh, delay or debate. But it's an election year. This is all politics. And so Biden's going to get blamed and he's going to have to respond uh, because he's in the president uh, seat right now. Well, uh, again, uh, th this is what this is uh, smart by the president to invoke uh, this particular uh, uh, National Defense uh, Act because it allows them to import, to bypass that ridiculous law and import baby formula uh, to, in order to actually uh, alleviate this problem, Robert. And, and look, Roland, I, I think this should also highlight the fact that baby formula is exceedingly expensive without uh, government assistance, uh, primarily because of the monopolies that exist. Uh, back when I was in college, I was a security guard at Kroger, right there on, uh, right there by the AUC. So we did the night shift. You know, the number one thing that people stole out of that Kroger, baby formula. Uh, and the, and so what they would do, they would steal large amounts and then resell it because they could resell it for a premium. It was literally like we a day didn't go by that we didn't catch somebody stealing baby formula. Um, a lady ran off. One of the guys I worked with chased after her. I made eight dollars an hour, so I ain't chasing nobody. And she hit him upside the head with one of those big cans of baby formula. So we came back covered in powder. It was hilarious. And uh, but uh, that's beside the point. I think what President um, Biden needs is a better communications team around him, uh, because what we don't see is him being able to send out surrogates on shows just like this to hit the late night shows, to hit all the uh, cable news shows so they can get the administration's a part of the story out there. You still see more uh, pundits and more spokespeople for President Trump than you see for President Biden. So because of that, you don't have anybody carrying the message. And going into November, you have to be able to show the American people that you're putting points on the board, that you're actually doing something to address these problems, that, they, that when they're solved, they aren't just mysteriously going away, but be, it's because of presidential action and the ability to show that the uh, deregulation the Republicans have been talking about for the last 30 years, cutting taxes on millionaires and billionaires result directly in the problems they have right now. And we actually need to have a functional federal government, which is willing to put the measures in place to put competence in the market, keep safe products on the shelf, and then address the failures of the last administration by actually putting in together a competent federal government that can address these issues. All right, folks, uh, let's talk about this story out of your state, Georgia, Robert. Uh, some high school, some students, they are actually suing uh, their school district for racial discrimination. Five black students at Coosa High School got suspended for wearing Black Lives Matter T-shirts, while white students were allowed to wear Confederate paraphernalia. The black students claim the school's administration failed to act on reports of racist behavior from white students. The lawsuit is requesting the five-day suspension be deleted from their records and that the school does more to handle racist bullying. Really, Scott? Black Lives Matter is a problem, but Confederate flags is cool. Really? It's, it's, it's a First Amendment issue, first of all. I've never believed it was a political statement. But in these rural counties, in these in Will County and Joliet, Illinois, where I grew up, in these southern counties where... You know, it's not on the national political or economic map. It happens all the time. When I was in high school in, in New Lenox, Illinois, one of the things I had to deal with, which is why I went to Morehouse College, was because once a week, someone would call me the N-word. These were white kids from rural America who were bust in to go to my high school. And while I went through various stages of it, and it was a Catholic high school, they couldn't understand or deal with the racism or my rage in response to it. And it went through several forms and formats. But in the end, many of these kids, they were never really disciplined. They had a conversation that I was called sensitive. I was told to ignore it, blah, blah, blah. 
all kinds of excuses were made, which simply uh, made no sense. And so it's these rural school districts where this is happening, they don't care what the national laws or state laws are. And it sounds like this school, the administrators don't know either. But this is a really interesting lawsuit because if they filed under the Equal Protection Clause or Equal Rights Amendment, then the regs and the activity, uh, the facts of the case, are going to be closely scrutinized uh, by the court to see if there's really evidence of unfair and unequal treatment. Uh, if it is, you've got a constitutional violation, civil rights violation, and this case, whether it, 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 it's local, if you will, and it's against the administrators of the school, it's really going to be about the, the school district, right? And if it gets appealed, this case in and of itself, long way away, could be uh, could go to the Supreme Court. It'll be interesting to watch if this if the school district doesn't settle. Robert, you're there in Georgia. Your thoughts? Uh, I think the school district get, the school district is absolutely going to settle. And I think they're lucky that these parents are only asking for a clean record uh, and uh, for a change in policy, yeah. and not for monetary damages. Because uh, frankly, in cases of this nature, we have multiple plaintiffs. You can probably file a class action against the district, and uh, and frankly, go directly after the county uh, in order to get monetary damages. So um, I agree with Scott that this will probably go up the ladder if it's not settled. But I think the school district understands that right now, what they're asking for will be them getting off light. And if they take, uh, if they don't end up settling with the students and doing some specific performance that they're requesting, they could end up in a monetary suit, which would be very deleterious to the school district. Monique? They'll change the lawsuit also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right lawyer will amend it, put in the constitutional violation. Monique, Monique, and, your comment. And then ride it out until it can't go any further, even if they try to settle. It'd be a big case. You done, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have one other thought, but it's your show, so I'll pass for now. <laughs> I mean, man, I said, Monique, your thoughts three times. Oh, I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you. Honest, I didn't. Yeah, I that's didn't the problem. Okay, when you keep talking, you can't hear. Well, I'm very insightful. I'm sorry. Uh, Mo Monique, <laughs> please. Go, go right in Yes. Here. I agree uh, with Robert and with the chatty one, Scott, on this. Um, whatever they do has to be uniform. Uh, carrying around a flag is not the same as wearing paraphernalia that maybe the policy says that they can't wear. I don't know the specifics on what the policy did and did not say. It has to be uniform across the board and hate speech. Um, the, the, the Confederate flag in certain circles can be viewed as a threat in and of itself, as it should be. I think there's actually case law about that. Scott's the smart one in the family, so he would know. Um, it, it's it's in the fighting word no, language. No, no, no. <laughs> he's not the smart no, one. No, we're not. We're not going back to Scott. We're not going back. Okay, no, but I'm, no, he's I, not. I was just, and we're not going I was, back to him. Thank you, Mark. I was okay. just referencing him. I don't want to go back to him. But what I do want to plug and say is, your friends from from the NFL, Lacey and Company, they they need a med mal lawyer. I understand what NFL mm -hmm. players go through, but what they're going through right now is um, medical malpractice, and it needs to be handled. Just thought I'd add that. Okay. We'll, we'll be happy to afford them your number. All right, y'all. Let's talk <laughs> Not about my number. Um, uh, in Ohio. Yeah, no. Uh, or Rob, one of y'all, one of y'all lawyers can take it. All right, let's talk about Ohio, where some parents are upset that some whites only signs and black only signs were placed on uh, water fountains. School officials say the signs were taken down within 30 seconds. No one saw them. Uh, the principal, Aaron Davis, sent this letter to parents. Earlier today, Coleraine High School administration was made aware of an inappropriate and racist message that was displayed at CHS. The administration is taking this incident very seriously as matters of racial sen insensitivity are not condoned or tolerated. We're currently in the process of investigating this matter. At this time, we have identified two students who were involved. Additionally, we have been made aware that the posting has been shared on social media. Any student, including those who are found to have taken part in sharing the post online, 
will also be subject to disciplinary action. The actions that were displayed do not reflect the values and culture of Coleraine High School or the, or the Northwest Local School District. CHS stands firm on creating a, a culture of inclusivity, respect, kindness, and compassion. As a school community, it is our responsibility to make sure that our CHS family uphold and live out these values. We will not stand for intolerance of any kind and will discipline any student who participates in displaying intolerant behavior. The three, the three students involved, they were indeed disciplined. All right then, well, got it. Now we know exactly how y'all feel about that. All right, y'all, uh, got to go to a break. We come back, we're going to talk with Marvin Sapp about uh, a new uh, CD he has. Also, our Fit Live Win, uh, excuse me, our um, uh, Tech Talk segment. Uh, it deals with a Get Fit Go app. We'll talk about that as well. So, and then, of course, I'm here uh, in Cedar Hill, uh, Texas, folks, uh, in less than uh, 20 minutes. Uh, I'm going to be uh, moderating a town hall with Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett. Uh, we're here at the Community Missionary Baptist Church in Cedar Hill. Uh, she is in a runoff against Jane Hamilton to replace, uh, the, for the, get the Democratic nomination, to replace Congresswoman Eddie Bridges Johnson, a longtime member of Congress who is retiring from that position. And so we'll be having that town hall after this. Uh, folks, if you're on Facebook and uh, YouTube, be sure to hit that uh, like button. Uh, let's hit 2,000 likes, y'all, on uh, YouTube. It's more than 3,000 of y'all watching. Go ahead and hit that button. Let's make it happen. If y'all also want to support us, please download the Black Star Network app. If you don't want, if you're having issues watching on Facebook or Twitch or Instagram uh, on YouTube, uh, then all you actually have to do, folks, is download the Black Star Network app. Uh, and again, it's available on Apple phone, uh, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, uh, Samsung Smart TV uh, as well. Uh, you can download it again on any of those devices, your iPad, uh, you name it. You see right here, I've got them right here uh, on uh, both of my devices uh, right here. Come back to me, please. Thank you very much. And you will see uh, today's show. Again, you hit that button. You can watch live. Uh, and then, of course, um, it's going to come up in a second. Let me do a full screen. And so you can actually see uh, the show uh, on, your, on your phone uh, right here. Uh, and so another way for you to actually see it. Uh, and so, again, download on any of these. Uh, if you've got multiple devices, download them on all different devices. And so uh, there you go right there. Also, of course, join our Bring the Funk fan club. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on a minimum of uh, 50 bucks each for the year. That's $4.19 a month. 13 cents a day uh, for them joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, of course, uh, there's no minimum, there's no maximum, and so we appreciate all the support. Cash or money orders, cash, excuse me, checks and money orders, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. Hmm. Why is it so hard to see Panther? What Bruh. deal? Wow. I mean, if you go to Amazon, I think I tried. Man. So I have a collection of. of That's of, a hard movie. They charge you three hundred dollars on Amazon. I was like, I'm not about to pay no four hundred dollars for yeah. a VHS cop. Yeah. What's the deal? Man, it is it is interesting, Rowan. It is the movie they don't want you to see. Power to the people. It's funny. I made New Jack City. You can get it anywhere. Posse, you can see it anywhere. But but a movie that says that. It is not an accident that we medicated the black communities right around the time when they were getting militant, when you had the Panthers starting to organize, the people starting to vote and march on Washington. We, we let these communities get med medicated. In fact, that comes up in The Godfather, you know, where they say, as long as it stays in the mm -hmm. black communities. So we asked the question, they tried to say, ask us questions. I asked them, the, the reporters when we did, I said, listen, why is it a 13-year-old boy in the hood can find a, a way to buy a gun, some liquor, or church, or some crack, and yet you can't find them to arrest those people. You can't arrest that deal. Why is that? Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph. Hello, everyone. It's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're at SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
All right, folks, uh, he is a 13-time Grammy nominee. Uh, he, of course, uh, uh, has released his 15th solo album. It is called Substance, and it is the uh, first uh, one released on his own uh, label. Uh, joining us right now is a uh, gospel singer, preacher, and he also belongs to that <laughs> little youth group, um, you know, they 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 wear well the red and white colors. Scott, you should be happy. Uh, I finally invited one of your fellow little Kappa brothers uh, on the show because uh, I know. See, you gotta understand, Marvin. We it's so many alphas doing great things that nearly every Wednesday it's an alpha on here, and Scott feels so lonely. And so we had to go ahead uh, and give him some company today by having you on. So um, maybe you only maybe Scott alphas. is now. I'm shocked that you uh, got him on. <laughs> Go ahead on. Well, no, I don't. I don't only invite alphas. Al alphas simply doing great things. Very few cappers off. So, Ma so Marvin, let's talk about right uh, uh, incredible let's... talent. Give him his just due. Let's do a cappa song. Will you get? Let us do a song for about two, two, uh, nope. two minutes on your show. We're gonna sing a favorite cappa hymn. You see, <laughs> the only reason I ain't cussing because <laughs> I am broadcasting in a church right now. <laughs> That's oh, the only reason. Bunch of trash. That's the only reason. But let me be real clear. You keep it up. I will go walking out of the parking lot and cuss you Don't out. Do Don't, right, do Don't do it. Don't do it. So tell us about. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. We let it. We're gonna let it pass, Marvin. Go on with your interview. Do your interview. We'll, we'll get him later. <laughs> Roller, you know he I love you. Go ahead and just turn Scott's microphone off. He you got to turn Scott's Roller. microphone off because he talking. Come on now. First of all, so first of all, uh, you ain't far from where I am. So are you are you in Fort Worth now, or you are somewhere else around the country? Well, actually, I'm home. I don't live in Fort Worth. I just passed it there, but I I stay in the DFW Metroplex, and and I love it, man. This is like. One of the greatest decisions I could have ever made in this season of my life was to uh, move from Grand Rapids to to Texas. And, and so, how long have you how long have you been pastoring uh, here in Fort Worth? Because I remember we talked and you talked about how difficult that decision was uh, to leave Grand Rapids, the school you had there, uh, yeah. to transition uh, to uh, Fort Party Worth to pastor. Well, I mean, it, let's see. It's, uh, it'll be three years in August. It'd be three years in August. When I first moved, uh, which was, was a trip, it was, it was great. I mean, I, I, a lot of people thought I left, you know, to come to a mega church, and, and I didn't. I moved down here to pastor a church uh, of approximately 250 people, and um, the church grew in six months from 250 to over 1,300 active, and then COVID hit. And, um, you know, but, you know, we transitioned. We shifted and uh, made sure that we were able to be you know, seen globally via all of our social media platforms and streaming and and we grew in spite of. So, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm thankful to be here. I'm chilling at my crib and um, just enjoying this 90 plus degree weather. <laughs> well, look, uh, I'm happy to be home uh, with uh, nine degree weather. I got sick and tired of those 50s and 60s in D.C. Uh, but, but I do want to pick up on that point that, that, that you just made because um, uh, because, again, you said you left to pastor a church of 250 people. You know, we're living in an age where I guarantee you somebody's watching going, oh my, what was he thinking? I mean, why is he not, why is he not leading a church with four, four or five or six or 10,000 members? Uh, t take us through that decision because, uh, so, again, the, the, the average person would go, well, someone of his stature I mean, that's just, that's, that's beneath him. No, absolutely not. I mean, if, if you do a statistical study, you will find that, you know, the majority of the churches in the country are only 75 members. I mean, so, yeah. you know, and, and not only that, but, you know, uh, less than 1% of churches are over 1,000. Um, so, you know, just having the opportunity to... Um, I don't know what just happened, but just having the opportunity to come down here and so, to start somebody watch somebody watching you on the show decided to Skype you. Oh, no, well, I, it probably I don't was know. Jamal Bryant. It, it, yeah. That was Monique. <laughs> that no, was but, Monique. But 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 but, but uh, you know, I 
I needed a change. You know, I had a great church in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I always tell people that mega churches are actually their relative, depends on where you stay. And being in Grand Rapids, Michigan, have a church, having a church there that had an active membership of over 500. You know, we owned a college campus there where our charter school was and did all of the things that we were able to do and we're absolutely debt free. You know, that was a great situation. But you never know how bad you need change until you get there. And with all of the things that have transpired in my life, and with my kids being grown, you know, I just really began to pray and really talk to God about shifting and changing and, and moving someplace to start over fresh. And uh, I had plenty of opportunities. Um, once I made the decision to shift, I don't know, it was like, you know, God just opened up the floodgates and there were a multiplicity of churches that gave me calls, wanted me to come and to move. And uh, I just decided to come to Funky Town. So, you know, it's, it has worked for me. Um, I love it here. My kids love it here. Uh, as a matter of fact, my son just moved here maybe about three months ago. He worked for Amazon <laughs> Services. So, I mean, like, it's a great church. It's grown, uh, and, and we're doing some great things in, in our community. Uh, let's talk about your new album. You, you, uh, you open your own label. Yeah. Um, talk about that as opposed to signing with someone else. Uh, what is it like? owning, completely controlling your content as opposed to asking someone else for permission? Well, I mean, that's everything. I mean, for 33 years, I've been in this industry. And honestly, for 33 years, I've been on a major label. I started off uh, with the company Word Epic and then ended up signing with Verity, which was a division of Sony, and then RCA. So my whole entire career has been nothing but um, being controlled. And I just said to myself, after 33 years of being in this industry and having a, a, a great base, you know, uh, it was kind of easy for me to make that shift and that transition to wanting to be my own boss and, and controlling uh, my own personal destiny simply because of, you know, I got a, I got a good audience. So I just believe that they're going to follow me wherever I go as long as I keep doing what is consistent musically. And uh, that's the way I try to keep it. I try to keep it churchy and funky all at the same time. So, you know, being on this side, though, is absolutely different because there were when, when I was so accustomed to going into the studio, doing a record, turning it in, having them put together a stylist and doing all of those different things. It was easy, to be honest with you. On this side where you control everything, you have to deal with manufacturers. You have to talk to uh, the different companies as it pertains to walmart and talking to uh all of the different distributors of music if they're doing a physical copy and or if they're doing digital you know so it's it's a whole nother world um having to make sure you calculate royalty rates and things of that nature so you know how to pay people um uh, but honestly it's been fun because i'd rather be on this side uh and be my own boss and cut out the middleman than to uh be on the other side where, you know, I was probably one of the last ones to be paid. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I can't hear you now. Something just happened. I can't hear you, Ro. There you go. All right, not sure what's going on. We got demons up in here. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> there you go. We can hear you now. All right, let's go. That's, the, that's those Kappa demons. All right, uh, Monique, <laughs> you get to ask the first question, not you, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a question, Pastor Sapp. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. God bless you, sir. God bless your life. Thank you for everything that you have meant to the gospel community to this world. Um, you've been a blessing in my life and the life of so many others. And I'm just thankful for all of your latest accomplishments. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do. Thank you so much. Robert. What will be your advice for, 
<laughs> what would be your advice for young pastors who are currently entering the, the ministry? There's a lot of conflicting uh, information out there, a lot of being pulled in a lot of different directions. Uh, I've spoken at seminary school recently to students about um, activism and uh, organizing. A lot of them say, well, I want to have a big house. They want to have a mega church. They want to be a celebrity. What, what would be your advice to, uh, to getting started? What should actually drive you into the ministry as opposed to some of the pulling towards fame and fortune that many people are uh, focused on now? What what's so amazing to me is is that they think that being a pastor is a fame and fortune type of situation. I mean, you know, once you get into it, you will understand that, you know, it's a life filled with service. And, you know, there's no guarantee that you're gonna have a five, ten thousand member church because the reality is is that the majority of the churches in America ain't five, ten thousand members. Uh, you know, that's it, it that's just it's a fallacy. So I would just really kind of challenge them and tell them that if you're serious about ministry and if you're serious about serving people, because that's what this is really all about, um, this is uh, a, a thankless job, to be perfectly honest with you, um, but it's also a rewarding job when you get the opportunity to see people's lives change and uh, you motivate them and encourage them to be better. Um, that's, that's the reason why I got into ministry, because I understood that this was my life's assignment. It wasn't because uh, I was looking for fame and or fortune. I, I, I got into it because I really wanted to see people's lives change um, through the word of God. And, and I've seen it. So so that's, to me, is, is what it's really all about. All right, Marvin. Well, uh, we appreciate it. All right, I guess I'll go ahead. Whoa, go ahead. whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa. I got a question. No way. No way. <laughs> oh no way! And you in church? Come on, Scott! Hurry up! Hurry up! <laughs> okay, hurry up! Okay, this is going to be good. I want to talk to uh, Pastor Sapp about another part of his life that you wouldn't even imagine. How I met him for the first time uh, three or four years ago. I was managing partner of Reed Smith, and Pastor Sapp and some colleagues of him came to the D.C. office, invited by Keon Pope, a former partner of mine, to talk for Black History Week program. And he broadcast to probably 29 offices worldwide. We had about 100, 150 people there. Do you remember, Pastor? I do. And At the I law firm of Reed Smith? It was fun. Now, now he don't remember. Yes, he does. Can I just give my question now? And so it, he talked about his life. Well, if you hurry up and ask the question, love of music. I mean, you gave us that long, that long, that long meet and greet? Come on. Can I just finish? He, it, it, was a, it was a very powerful interview to people that you didn't think he would normally understand or appreciate his gospel music. Everybody, black, white, yellow, and brown was there. And so I want to thank you for that. And I want to also ask you, how often do you do that? Because it doesn't matter what music and what your calling is. I thought your interview was just super powerful about life, as well as how you develop your music and your calling from God. Well, I mean, you know, I, I do it often because, I mean, I just think that if you just keep it 100 and you be real about what you do and who you are and be as translucent as possible, I struggle with transparency because I just mm -hmm. don't think see everything about your life. Um, but you need to be selective and, and discreet about what you show people and, and what you share. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I get the opportunity to share my life with a lot of people. As a matter of fact, uh, on the 21st of August, uh, we just finished filming, and it will be out on uh, TV One, uh, the Never Would Have Made It story, uh, Never Would Have mm. Made It, that, you know, uh, biopic. So this has given me an opportunity to be able to share aspects of my life and allow people to see things that, you know, most people don't know. They just know Never Would Have Made It. They know the preacher and singer, but they don't know the gay yeah. man mess. So I'm I'm really excited about having the opportunity to really share some things about my life with people so that they can see that no matter where you come from, no matter how bad things might have been in the beginning, that you still have the opportunity to yeah. shift, change, and, and make things better and make something better out of your life. Yeah, I certainly look forward to seeing it. Thank you, Roland. Ro, listen, the album is available yeah, right up? now. It's available right now. You can all pre-order it. It actually comes out on June the 10th. It comes out on June the 10th, but you can... Uh, 
pre-order it on any and or every one of your media platforms. You can go to my website if you want physical copy because I do still understand that everybody is not, you know, tech savvy. There's a whole lot of people that still want the CD so they can read the credits and stuff. Uh, but you can go to Amazon, any place that you get your music. I promise you it's going to be a great blessing to you. Substance is going to be hot. Well, 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 also, what some folks don't know is that when they download music, they don't realize they don't actually own the music. You're actually licensing the music. Uh, those of us who grew up, well, you know, we have relatives who pass down albums. You actually can't pass down digital music uh, without that username and password. And so the physical copy is still uh, is still worthy. So, yeah, I, I understand that. And Scott, you had no idea what I just said. Trust me. So you probably one of the physical copy people. All right. Uh, Marvin Sapp, <laughs> always glad to see you. Uh, again, uh, one of the uh, two or three Kappas I tolerate in my life, along with Jamal Bryant. Oh, you uh, like me. And, you know uh, you like us. Scott you you like us. You like us. We family. We brothers. You well, know, look, you know look, we no, brothers. I, you know, look, look, y'all all need an alpha around y'all to hold y'all up, to lift y'all up, and to lay hands on y'all when y'all get extra. <laughs> so, well, y'all be sure to get... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Y'all be sure to get uh, Pastor Sam uh, his uh, get his new CD. And if y'all are in Fort Worth, uh, give folks the name of the church so they can stop by and leave their tithe and offering when they come by. Well, just come by first. Chosen Vessel Church in the city of Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> All they got to do is just Google my name and the church will come up, I promise you. You have a great time. You can watch me every Sunday, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time on any and or all of our social media platforms. Now, Scott need to send you an offering. Scott, I'm, no. Scott I'm, I think you should send your Kappa brother a $5,000 offering uh, uh, for, for a program at the church. Uh, I, I'm just going to go ahead and call it out. So, uh, so uh, uh, Pastor Sapp, be sure to let me know uh, when uh, Scott's uh, uh, direct deposit went through. Let me know when we'll it happened. Because we'll pa if you were alpha, I, if you were alpha, I, I would have done that. My money's tight. <laughs> oh, now you're no longer his Kappa brother. I, See how y'all are? You know, All right, Pastor Sapp, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. In the Bible. I love y'all, man. Take it easy. Lawyers, or was that the tax collector? The tax collector, <laughs> Jesus, spoke, spoke ill of, didn't it? <laughs> Scott, Scott, you ain't read your Bible in about 25 years. <laughs> yeah, but I know that. Here, thanks so much. <laughs> I know that. I talked to you later, Folks, man. I got to go to a real, a real uh, yes, sir, I appreciate it. Real quick break. We come back to Tech Talk for our final segment on Roland Martin Unfiltered. The Black Star Tech Talk broadcasting live from CDL. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach and host of Get Wealthy. Let me hit you with a few numbers. African Americans spend nine times the amount on ethnic beauty products and yet only own 1% of the beauty supply stores. It's an $18 billion industry. On the next Get Wealthy, you're going to learn and hear from a woman who's turning this obstacle into an opportunity. We literally take you from A to Z on all of the things step by step you need to have in place to open and run a very successful beauty supply store. That's right here with me, Deborah Owens, host of Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Ha 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 Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, a lot of people are intimidated uh, by fitness apps, things along those lines. They see the hard bodies and all this sort of stuff along those lines. So my next guest actually created this app called Ready, Get, Fit, Go. Uh, it is targeting uh, folks uh, who are plus size and also 
fitness newbies. Uh, Chamara Bentley experienced her own health transformation uh, and wrote a book called How to Lose Weight Fast When You Lack Motivation. She joins us now from Cleveland, Ohio. Chamara, glad to have you. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, what, what was the issue for you? And so uh, was it was it you just didn't want to do it? Um, and, and then what you and then and what, what spurred you to get going? Well, I started off at 403 pounds and I was just at a really low point in my life. And I was so sick and tired of feeling how I was feeling. And I knew I needed to make a change. So it's just like one day I said, enough's enough. And I just, I got up and I just tried doing some workouts. Um, I did discover that because I was overweight, my body wasn't able to physically do this, the kind of moves that I was trying to do. So that's when, you know, I started just like making mm -hmm. my own workouts and that's where I just started. So on your app, you focus on low intensity workouts. Again, a lot of people, they jump right into it, but they really aren't physically able to do so. Uh, and so it's because of what you experienced, is that how you tailored your app? Yes, yes. Basically, you know, I wanted to just make workouts for people who were like me. And um, I just wanted like all my workouts are just for beginners. And so it just I wanted it to be easy so people wouldn't become discouraged and they, too, can begin in self-love slash weight loss journey as well. Uh, well, th if this was a second about guns, Robert Patillo would be excited. Uh, so I know uh, he appreciates hearing about these low intensity workouts. Robert, you get the first question. I do have a, have a question. So we, we've heard a lot in the media, particularly uh, recently about body positivity uh, and kind of this campaign against fat shaming. Uh, how do you uh, how do you kind of balance that and also convincing people that it is good and positive to actually start working out and losing weight and getting in shape for their own personal health? Well, you know, it's, it's okay to want to be healthy, you know? I mean, obviously, I've lost 116 pounds, and I'm still plus size, but I wanted to just be a healthier version of myself, and I just want to encourage, you know, just being healthy and happy, you know? The goal isn't to be skinny, just, you know, healthy, so I, I still love who I am. I still love my thickness. I love, you know, everything that I do. I just want to be healthy. All right, uh, Monique, question. Sure. Um, where where can can people get started? You know, if they are stuck in a rut and are basically emotionally exhausted and not able to find the motivation to do anything at all, what do you suggest? I definitely. You have to. So I, it's a weight loss journey, but it's also a self. -love. So you definitely have to start with like putting yourself first and you have to change your mindset. And it's not something, this is a lifestyle change. So it's not something that's going to, you know, just happen overnight. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to just, you know, make the init initiative to make a change and you have to, you know, start off slow so you don't become overwhelmed. I feel like that's where a lot of people end up, you know, kind of not succeeding or wanting to give up because they they're so overwhelmed with just wanting to just make a big old change. You know, you just start with a small goal and, you know, we have a big goal. We see the bigger picture, but break it down a bit and make it a small goal. So it, eventually you will get to your bigger goal. So if you say you want to lose 100 pounds, that's great. But maybe bring it back and just say, OK, for the first month, I want to lose 10 pounds and I want to lower my carb intake and I want to increase my protein, drink more water, and then you'll you'll get to that bigger goal. But just you don't want to overwhelm yourself. So you just start with just changing your mindset and just, you know, you just gotta put yourself first. Scott Bolden. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being on the show and congratulations on your weight loss. Uh, but there's an emotional and psychological side to weight loss as well. And can you talk a little bit about that, not just from a body image standpoint, but psychological dependence on food, how you interact with food, why you overeat, not you, but you generally overeat. And really, what's that battle like 
notwithstanding the workouts and, and the app? It's, it's, it's hard. That's why I call it a self-love journey because you do have to work on things mentally. So it's really important to journal. Um, everything's not going to work for every person, but you should start off with writing down your emotions because a lot of people emotionally eat. And um, so definitely, you know, just um, like I said, journaling and just telling, like looking in the mirror and just telling yourself positive affirmations and you, you have to do the work. So it's a self-love journey as well. Um, mm -hmm. it's hard when, you know, we all get cravings for certain foods, but that's what I talk about when it comes to setting small goals. So you can say for the next three days, I'm going to, you know, eat this this so you know you can kind of not become overwhelmed and fall back into your old habits you know you you be, become more proud of yourself and just stay encouraged and it's like a mindset so definitely just taking things slow and just writing things down is um, a big part of it because it's it, it is mental with any change not just weight loss so Thank all you. right, the app is ready, get, fit, go. Uh, I think it's on all the available platforms. Uh, Jamara uh, Bryant, we certainly uh, appreciate uh, you joining us on the show, uh, and good luck with the app. Thank you so much. All right, thanks so much. Take care. All right, Scott, Monique, Robert, I certainly appreciate y'all joining us on today's show. That is it for us. We're going to go to a break, though. We come back. We're going to be uh, here live uh, in, uh, in uh, Cedar Hill. Uh, of course, uh, for this town hall with Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett, who is uh, in a runoff with Jane Hamilton to uh, win the Democratic nomination to replace a longtime uh, CBC member, Eddie Bernice Johnson. So we're going to got some questions for her and the audience here at, ready to ask her some questions as well. So we live streaming uh, the town hall uh, as well. Of course, we'll be doing this throughout between now and November uh, in other states as well. So we're here in Texas, my home state. And so we certainly appreciate that. So we'll be right back from Cedar to Hill. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. A few years ago, I stood before the nation and said we needed to be moral defibrillators. We needed to shock the heart of this nation. They tell me that when the heart is in danger, somebody has to call an emergency code. And somebody with a good heart will bring a defibrillator to work on a bad heart. Because it's possible to shock a bad heart and revive the pulse in this season when some want to harden and stop the heart of our democracy. We are being called like our foremothers and fathers to be the moral defibrillators of our time. But when I look at now how after, in the middle of a pandemic, we still don't have the conscience to do what ought to be done when it comes to COVID relief and health care for all. This is, this is the answer to these 14 points. Right. Raising the wage, updating the poverty measure, housing for all, federal jobs program for all, protect voting and civil rights, guarantee quality public, high quality public education, immigrant reform, immigrant justice, immigrant rights, fair taxes, using the executive orders. When we look at all these things, I'm convinced that we need a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. So I went to a friend of mine, Dr. Jackson, who's a heart specialist, who does transplants. And I said, tell me, how do you get to the this decision to transplant a heart? And he said, well, first of all, Barbara, we gotta have a meeting before we ever transplant the heart, he said, we have to have a meeting. Yeah. I said, you got to have a meeting? He yeah. said, yes. He said, we have to bring the best yes. of every area because the question is, how do you transplant the heart without killing the body? 
there's got to be a meeting. It's not an easy decision. Because you can't, you don't want to take the heart out and kill the body. He says, so every heart transplant takes everybody. It takes the whole team. It takes a meeting. No one person can do it alone. No one group can do it alone. No one surgeon can do it alone. And when I left his office, I began to think that the same is true if you're going to change the heart of a nation. There has to be a meeting. And then the Holy Ghost got a hold of me and said, Baba, you didn't have to go to the doctor. You could have went to God. Because everywhere in the Bible there was fundamental change. It began with a meeting. In the first book of the Bible, it doesn't, God doesn't say let me. He says let us. Uh, there's a meeting that came together that created hu cre humanity as we know it. When they got ready to deal with Pharaoh, they had a meeting down at the Red Sea. They all came together and the sea opened up and Pharaoh drowned. Ah, uh, when Goliath was running around saying what he was going to do, David had a meeting with five rocks. He got one for Goliath and four for the rest of his cousins. Ah, uh, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, they had a meeting. Down in the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel, the Bible said they had a meeting. And the bones came together and the spirit blew on them. Jesus had a meeting one day with 5,000 and a few loaves of bread. Yeah, yeah. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a meeting because the Bible said the prophets that had been dead long ago when he died, they got up. Yeah. On Pentecost, there was a meeting. Yeah. The wind began to blow and, the, and tongues of fire came and, and, the, and the word came that, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Yeah. But then I started reading the history in 1852, yeah. after the Dred Scott decision, there was a meeting. Was a meeting. The abolitionists came together and they said, maybe this decision is just one link of the chain of events necessary for the whole downfall of the system of slavery. Yeah. Therefore, what they have done has only emboldened and intensified our agitation. Yeah. There was a meeting when Sojourner Truth yeah. and Lucretia Mott came together yeah. and they began to build the women's suffrage movement. Yeah. And they joined at Seneca Fall. There was a meeting when the social gospel movement came together. And they began to declare in the face of gross greed and industrialism that we could not turn away from the children. And they asked the question, what would Jesus do? In the 1920s, there was a meeting called the Bonus Marches. And folk came together to fight for fair wages. And that led to the New Deal. When black and white and Jewish civil rights lawyers had a meeting. In the 1950s, and they decided to take down Jim Crow. And to take down Separate But Equal. In Montgomery, they had a meeting. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, they had a meeting. Then in Selma, they had a meeting. Ah, uh, at the Greensboro, at the lunch counter, they had a meeting. In Birmingham, they had a meeting. Started with 40 people, but by the time it was over, thousands had been arrested and Bull Connor was brought down. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. When Cesar Chavez was alive, they had a meeting in California. And the workers marched and they fasted. Right now at Oak Flats, the Apache Nation is having a meeting. And all of these meetings change the heart of the nation at that particular point. I just come by to declare that it's time on June 18th for us to have a meeting. For us to have a moral meeting. For us to have a meeting in the streets. Children got to be saved. It's time to have a meeting. Sick folk got to be healed. It's time to have a meeting. Low wage workers got to be paid. It's time to have a meeting. Housing must be provided for all. It's time to have a meeting. The atmosphere must be saved. It's time to have a meeting. Indigenous people must be treated right. It's time to have a meeting. Voting rights must be expanded and protected. It's time to have a meeting. We're spending too much money trying to blow up the world rather than save the world. It's time to have a meeting. Too much religion is being used to push hate rather than love. It's time to have a meeting. We've got to change the heart of this nation. It's time to have a meeting. This nation needs a heart transplant. It's time to have a meeting. Are you all ready for the meeting?
Are you ready for the meeting? Are you ready for the meeting? God said, if you will have a meeting, I'll show up. I'll bless you. I'll give you power. I'll strengthen you. I'll make you strong. I'll give you favor. I'll make you able to turn this country around. But first, you must have a meeting. Folks, we are here at Community Missionary Baptist Church in Cedar Hill, Texas. Uh, shortly, we're about to begin our town hall with uh, Texas State Representative Jasmine Crockett, who is trying to uh, win the Democratic nomination runoff uh, to uh, seat uh, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson in Congress. She has represented this district uh, for quite some time. Uh, congressional districts, uh, 700,000 people all across the country. Uh, of course, the district uh, not just here in Cedar Hill, but it stretches uh, from here all, all, all across uh, the Metroplex, even through Irving. Uh, and so, uh, uh, Ibrahim Johnson, she has actually endorsed that rocket. Tomorrow on our show, we talked with Jane Hamilton, who is her, her opponent uh, in this runoff. Uh, early voting is taking place right now uh, in uh, this uh, state uh, for these runoffs. As you see, my sticker, uh, oops, my bad. Uh, I did vote earlier. Okay, all the people who are here, who's already voted? Who's already voted? All right, let's see here. Keep your hand up. All right, so about half, about half the room is already voted, uh, and so uh, and so uh, other folks uh, have not. Uh, and so uh, what we're seeing, of course, uh, final efforts. Folks are going door to door. You see the campaigning. You're seeing uh, commercials still being run. All of those uh, things that are happening all across the area uh, in the final stages of this campaign. As I said earlier. Uh, primaries are happening all across the country in different states. Last night, uh, Kentucky, Idaho, North Carolina. Uh, you also saw Pennsylvania, Oregon, all those states. People went to the polls last night uh, in the Democratic and Republican primaries. And then, of course, every single week you're actually seeing that. Uh, you have people, places like in Florida and Louisiana where their primaries uh, are, like Florida, their primary is in August. And then you have the general election uh, taking place in November. Uh, and so, uh, Texas, so, uh, the primary actually was, uh, in, uh, what was it, March? It was in March? And then, of course, the runoff, uh, for those contested races. This is, the, this is not the only contested race. Uh, there were a number of positions that were still contested. And so, any runoff around the state is still taking place on Tuesday. Uh, today, of course, uh, is Wednesday. Early voting ends on, uh, Friday. There's no early voting on Sunday. Because you know Republicans didn't want people to vote. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, souls to the polls uh, on uh, on Sunday. So uh, that is what uh, is, is happening uh, here. And so look forward to this conversation. Uh, I've got, got a few questions for uh, Jasmine Crockett. His audience has some questions as well. Um, let me throw this out. Um, let's see here. Uh, Anthony, are y'all, one of y'all switching? I want to be switching. Um, and so we'll, we'll bring this up. So let's see here. Show of hands. I'll ask this first. Um, uh, economy, is it the most important issue? Raise your hand. Okay. Education. Oh, first, first of all, he, first of all, he goes, uh, okay, all right. He raises his hand. He's like, yeah, okay. So, okay, education. All right. Let's see here. Voter suppression. And you can vote more than one time. It's okay. It's okay. All right, let's see here. All right, voter suppression. Got it. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, housing. Mm, okay. How many people here are homeowners? How many folks are renters? Homeowners first. Ah, most of the folks in here are homeowners. All right, then. Uh, renting. Got it. All right, let's see. Uh, student loan debt. Okay. All right. She, okay, she got both hands up. Okay. You, yeah, you, 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 well, either you either have the debt or you got a kid in school. Oh, it's your debt. It's your debt. Got it. Got it. I, in fact, I saw a tweet today from a guy who he took out 75000 student loans. He's paid back 
179000 but he still owes 200000 Because of interest. And he said, that's it. He said, y'all ain't getting no more. He said, I'm just going to die owing y'all. I mean, he literally said, he said, I ain't spend, I'm not sending any more money. He said, he said, that's it. He said, so y'all can do what y'all want to do, but I've been paying way too long. It's not going to happen. So uh, I, I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, transportation. All right. Got one person over there. Let's see. Economic development. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, Cedar Hill. Okay. So of the folks in here, um, what areas of the district do you live in? So how many people in here are Cedar Hill? Soto, Lancaster, Duncanville, Grand Prairie, Irving, Dallas. Okay, all right then, all right. Good, good cross-section of folks uh, in the room. All right then, uh, let's see here. Where they at? They told the brother five minutes. I'm like, okay, it's been five minutes. So let's go. It's 7:22. I got quick. You know, you know what I think they're probably doing? They're probably doing like them old, like these old black churches, where y'all, y'all are going to the event where it, it is old walk in. Man, let me tell you something. I was a keynote speaker at an Eastern Star event. Man, first of all, you know it was something when they had corsages and boutonnieres, and they insisted on me wearing that boutonniere. Now, y'all have to understand, my grandmother had a catering business. So we used to do that. I hate wearing boutonnieres. First of all, why is it called a boutonniere? It's a flower. That's all it is. It's a flower with a leaf behind it, with some green tape at the bottom. That's all it is. They insisted, and I refused to wear it. I said, nope, I'm not wearing it. And so they had a whole march in. I'm talking about we had to line up. No, get the stand here. I was like, y'all, can we just go sit down? They had this entire elaborate march in. I was like, man, I, literally, I almost just went and sat down and said, man, y'all come on up. Uh, so that's, I think that's probably what they're doing back there. They got some kind of like elaborate, like everybody line up. They probably got some music, something like that. I don't know, I don't know what, what it is. So. Uh, but tell them, come on, because uh, we ain't trying to be here all night. Uh, y'all got, y'all. Y- y- y'all got to get to the crib, folks. Uh, now, how many people came straight from work to come to the town hall? Three of y'all. Okay, okay, cool. Everybody else, like, we work at home. Yeah, see, there you go. See? I got, see? I got you. I got you. All right, come on in. Are they, are they coming? Yes. Easy, because we're live streaming. Because I was live on my show. I was standing right here. Girl, what you think I was doing? I, I did the show live from, I was right here. He said, how's he doing the show? Because I was here. Y'all can come in. Y'all can, y- y- y'all got to be afraid. Y'all can sit in the front row. Y'all can sit over here. It's all good. Ain't nobody going to bite. Is that Congresswoman? Let me tell y'all something. Every time Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, would, would, uh, we would call her office to get her on my show, and her staff would say, oh, we have to check the Congresswoman's schedule, and I would say, I am a constituent. And then the whole tone would change. And they thought my staff was lying. They thought, oh, and then I, had, I said, no, 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 no. I said, I own a home in Cedar Hill. And then, oh, she'll be on the show tomorrow. Oh, yeah, trust me. Oh, some of y'all look like, yes, yeah, I've actually owned, owned my home here since 1999. She goes through that word in 98. So, yeah. Whenever the congressman would come on the show, it would always be like, glad to have you here. So she like, I definitely got to answer his questions because he's a voter. Because he's a constituent. Yeah, okay, great. All right, y'all, give it up again for retiring Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson.
How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. They gonna hand you a microphone. Sit the way you want to sit. Sit the way. Either one. Huh? I've had a deal replacement. Come on. Yeah, we were just waiting on y'all. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. We, we don't wait for the we don't wait for the show to start. We go. All right, go right ahead, Doc. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Mason. I am proud, humble to be the mayor here in the city of Cedar Hill. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. Of course, you already uh, heard from uh, from our uh, distinguished guest. But uh, yes, Roland Martin is uh, from Cedar Hill. This is his home. So we do welcome you to be here well, with hold us up, for hold today. Up. I'm from Houston. Right. We, 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 we know I'm that. I'm from Houston, but I've owned a home here for the last 23 years. <sighs> That's correct. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, the first time I actually met Roland was actually on the golf course. I don't know if you remember this, uh, but this was probably about 11 years ago. And uh, I didn't know that he was going to be playing with me and my team. And uh, he came out in his Houston, Texas gear. His bag was Houston, Texas. So I, I, I remember, I, I remember that you didn't you know where you're from, where you represent. And I hate the Cowboys. I remember that. Hey. Go 0-16. <laughs> but uh, let's go ahead and give Roland Martin some love. Let's go ahead and give him love. Thanks for being here. We want to go ahead and keep this going. Of course, you see the congresswoman is up here. She's been serving uh, a, a congressional district 30 for 30 years. And she is here with us today. So I want to go ahead and, and get this started. Mr. Roland Martin, I'll go ahead and kick it over to you, sir. All right. That's it. I just check. Ain't no prayer or nothing. I'm just good. I'm, I'm just checking. I'm just checking. Yeah. Okay, that's no problem. No problem. All right. Uh, so I'll start this way, Congresswoman. Uh, first of all, I ask you this here: uh, breaking news. Uh, President Biden has authorized the Natural Defense Act to allow the importing of baby formula. You are a nurse. Uh, and talk about uh, that particular issue and him using that act uh, to fix what is what is now a major crisis in this country. Yes, it is, and I hope that uh, his attention, his attention being given to this issue, will bring about a solution. Uh, of course, it started uh, when there were some questions about uh, supply and the war that's going on and the origin of different goods that had been limited. But now we know that we have got to have this formula. It has affected every family with a young child, all, all to the point where some parents cannot even go to work. So we'll see some relief. We are beginning to see some relief now, but we will see more and more. This is an administration that has been challenged tremendously. And I could go on about what brought us here, but I won't do that. But I will say that he does have a cabinet and leadership that's ready to do what it takes to make sure that we bring some as quick as possible relief to whatever the problems are. And I think you will see that relief very, very shortly. Uh, let's talk about COVID. Uh, folks out here, some are where they're mad, some are not. Uh, how many people in here have been fully vaccinated and boosted? Third booster, got it. Fourth booster. All right, let's see. Okay, all right. Now this, this is also a little younger crowd, so they ain't got to hit that fourth booster just yet. Um, look, this uh, the variant. Uh, this new variant is causing tremendous problems. Uh, I had COVID in December and then got it again three weeks ago. Uh, luckily, uh, I uh, tested negative the last uh, three days, and and and, and the, the crazy thing is. We're having a difficult time trying to get people to now accept the third booster. Uh, and some folks just say, you know what, I don't care. Uh, I'm seeing some experts say that we may have to get used to these variants, potentially people getting COVID two to four times every year. Well, I think ultimately we're going to have to treat this virus like we do the flu that probably every year we're going to have to get a booster. Now, we got off to a rocky start. Uh, in this country because it came right at the change of an administration where you had different philosophical views. 
You had a change in the leadership of the health enterprise uh, in the country as well. While one were more, one segment that's in there now, uh, a little bit more conservative in looking at how we should protect ourselves than another. <coughs> and I try very hard to be non-political when it comes to health issues. But I have had difficulty with the resistance that we see among people because this is a communicable disease. We have had a history of communicable diseases. That's why all of us had to have vaccines before we went to school. Uh, and I was a student nurse when we were dealing with polio. And being up at South Bend, Indiana, I had to go to the rural areas and give out uh, socks, vaccines, and everybody cooperated. All you needed was an, one arm after another. And now you don't hear about polio. But we have not reacted in that fashion to these vaccines. And so the more we neglect the vaccine, the more opportunity it is for variants to develop. Because it means that whoever you sit next to, you're not sure where they've had it. And each time it takes on another strand, it takes on a different appearance and perhaps even builds some resistance. So in a real environment of democracy, of making that choice, we have made it worse for ourselves. Uh, no one questioned whether a child had to get vaccinated to go to school because in Texas, as a state law, they couldn't start the school until they got the vaccines. We're not that sure on this one, or at least those rules have not come down. And so we have people, I just imagine there are some of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, that don't like the fact that you have to get a vaccine and you just haven't done it. Well, what you were not aware of is that you could be a carrier. And so until we get to the point where we have just about gotten everyone protected, we will still be dealing with different forms of it. And when this is over, keep in mind, there will be others. And why? Because of climate change. In the past, we had cold winters almost everywhere in the world. And when we had those cold winters, bacteria was killed when it was freezing. Now we have mostly warm weather. And that is the environment that causes virus and other bacteria to grow. Due to climate change. And so we're going to see more and more. So this is not going to be the only virus we're going to deal with. But I would suggest that we read and listen closely because we all are vulnerable. You decided to uh, retire after three decades uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, you could have uh, sat this out that the voters decided. You decided to endorse uh, Jasmine Proctor. Why? I'm glad you asked that question uh, because I was contacted by many more people that filed. And quite a few of the, I say most of the people that did file came to me before they did file. And I listened to all of them. I didn't find a single one I didn't like. But what I was looking for was someone who was young, well prepared, had the energy and the interest to take chances on getting things done. And when I noticed Jasmine Crockett's energy, her preparation, her willingness to work 24 hours if it took that, then she became a person that I went to and asked her to run because I know what this job entails. So you, you asked her to run? I asked her to run. Talk about what the job what the job entails. Um, prior to you asking her, how long did you know her? I'd only known her about a year and a half. And I had not noticed her that much until I was at home and they were having hearings and I tuned into the hearings at the state level and I noticed how quick she was 
to come back with questions, to ask detailed questions, details that you need to know if you're going to make a decision. I didn't see people that had been sitting there for years asking that many questions. They had lots of witnesses. She listened to the witnesses. And I said to myself, I've got to find out who this is. Uh, because I had met her, but I'd never really had a conversation with her. And so we started to talk. And during the time of redistricting, she was on it 18 and 20 hours a day and would work on a map. And she said, I'm going to run out here to the airport and I'm going to run up there and get, let me sit down and let you look at this because i got to be back here by 6 for a vote. And it was that kind of energy and effort that she was willing to put into that job to make sure she was doing everything she could. And that's the kind of energy it takes to make it in Washington. You know, nobody offers you much. As a matter of fact, I don't know anything they offer you in Washington. You got to go after what you think you should be doing at home. And I know some people that stayed up there a long time. They can't tell you anything they did. I know some that stayed up there a shorter time and can't tell you anything they did. So when you work for people who don't do nothing, you don't learn how to do nothing. <laughs> well, with that said, let's go ahead and get it started with some questions for uh, State Rep. Jasmine Crockett. Jasmine, come on up. Mask now. You ain't losing the mask. All right, you mic'd up and everything. We good? Can y'all hear me? I don't think y'all hear my mic though. Can you hear my? Oh, there All we right, go. We got it. Yep. All right, got your Delta red on. I do. Yes. <laughs> and the stars are in here. Oh, uh, here we go. Don't get rolling started, y'all know. Y'all know. Hey, listen, my pastor back here somewhere. He got your back. There go past the hand. There you go. He got your back. Let's get, get, get right into it. Uh, first off, so the congresswoman said uh, she went to you uh, uh, to run. Um, look, Washington, D.C. is a whole different animal than Texas legislature. Legislature meets every two years. Congresswoman knows that well. She served in legislature. Um, why did you want to make that jump? Why do you want to represent this congressional district in D.C.? Yeah, first of all, thanks for the question. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. You know, I don't know that it's more so a want so much as it is a responsibility. I know how I got here. I'm only the 22nd African-American woman ever elected to the Texas House. The Congresswoman is one of the first two African-American women elected to the Texas House 50 years ago. The reality is that we are under attack in this country. And when I say we are under attack, I'm talking about our constitutional rights. For those that believe that we're going to stop at Roe v. Wade, just keep living. That's not what it's going to be. Speaking of being under attack, we all saw what happened in Buffalo. The reality is that we have people that are serving in positions that, number one, a lot of them are not qualified. Let's be real about that. Number two, we have a lot of people that are so concerned about their reelection that they won't function and work for the people. I'm tired of it. The reality is that the state of Texas led the entire country in the wrong direction. I said that we had laws that were spreading across the country like a cancer, and they were starting right here in Texas. Guess what? We just had redistricting. Do you think it's going to get any better in Texas? Absolutely not. And so they own the House, they own the Senate, and they absolutely own the governor's mansion. The answer is on the federal level. And to have someone who has been an elected official for 50 years, an elected legislator for almost the entire 50 years, Call me as a freshman. First of all, I thought I was being punked. I'm going to just tell you that. <laughs> I was like, where the cameras? But that means a lot to me because she did know a lot of people in this race. She knows my opponent very well, but she chose me. And so to me, it's a responsibility to my community. My community needs someone who is going to dedicate their everything to this position. And that's exactly what I'm prepared to do. Yeah. 
I've talked about, uh, obviously, the issues that are in Washington, D.C., but the reality is a member of Congress represents their district. Absolutely. Uh, what do you see as uh, the top two or three dominant issues for this congressional district? What, what, what are its needs? What do you want to do to improve those things here in this district? Absolutely. So first of all, the economy. And I think that that's actually across the board. I'm going to be honest. I mean, I think that when we talk to people, I want to say about 30 percent of the people, it was the one category that most people said, listen, we're concerned, right? Yeah, because I asked, right I asked now, the question earlier, uh, and that actually uh, what was the most issue in the, uh, 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 the economy and education. Ab absolutely. When you're going to the gas pump, and you're saying, am I spending five dollars? In fact, I got a text like that, like, are we really paying this much for gas? The inflation. When I talk to my seniors, because I've been out to the senior homes and they tell me, listen, our rent is going up, our food bill is going up, gas is going up, but somehow my social security check, it ain't going up, right? And so when you deal with those working mothers, say in my South Dallas area that are saying, listen, I do want to go back to work. But childcare is too expensive. I've got two or three children. And so I want to go back to work, but they're trying to pay me $10 an hour. Well, by the time I do that math, I may as well stay home and keep my kids. And so these are the things that we have to fix for them. And I understand that it's going to take a combination, not just the feds. You can't look at one level of government and say that they will fix everything. But that's why I'm proud. We've got a number of city elected officials here that stand with me because it's going to take those on the city level those on the county level and those on the federal level staying in constant communication. Because if I'm in D.C., how am I supposed to know everything that's going on at home? I'm going to have to rely on those on the city level. They touch everybody way before we do. And they've got to tell me, listen, Rip, we need you to go get this money because this is one of the issues that we're having. And so we saw that bipartisan infrastructure bill that got passed. My biggest question was, now what y'all going to do with that money? Who y'all going to give it to now, right? Because we need to promote... Um, economic growth and prosperity right here. If we have those that are qualified, if we have those that are out of work, I don't get to say that. The Congresswoman can tell you. On the federal level, all we do is say, here's the money, right? But our city elected officials, who I'm going to call my friends, they can. They can say, this is what we're looking for as it relates to a specific contract, right? We don't need other people coming from somewhere else when we need to promote economic opportunities right here in the district. Let's talk about let's talk about housing. So when I bought my home here in 1999, first of all, 90% of this stuff wasn't here. Oh yeah. I'm like, <laughs> none of this stuff was. Yeah. Here. Okay. Uh, and and I remember literally the orange flags that are in the ground. Uh, there were very few homes that were in the subdivision, and so this place has exploded uh, over the last uh, 23 years. The question, though, is is let's deal with the housing issue. In the last three years, I've gotten more, t if you're a homeowner, have they been blowing your phone up with text messages, offering you cash for your house? Because we're in a major housing crisis. Wall Street had the toxic assets, they held onto them, they sold lots of 25,000 homes off of the hedge funds. Now, major hedge fund folks are owning homes, and if you want to buy a home, you literally can't even afford it. And so, what are, what are you proposing to do to deal with the issue of housing? Because some reports suggest that we have a two to three million home deficit in this country, and people are literally paying double for rent than they would if they actually own the home. home. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is the number uh, one thing for us as well. And so, for me, one of the first agencies that I thought I should start talking to is HUD. And so in talking to our soror, Secretary Fudge, um, you know, I was like, what, what are y'all seeing? What are y'all hearing? Because let me tell you what's going on in Dallas, because you're talking about the entire country, but it is exacerbated on a whole other level in Dallas. Because number one, the state of Texas is growing at a crazy high rate. We added four million new people in the last decade. We were the fastest growing state. That's why we ended up getting two new congressional seats. And so at the rate that we've got um, all of these businesses that are coming not only to the DFW, but all of our large urban centers, you know, we've got Elon Musk who decided he was going to bring Tesla down to Austin. What happened? He had to bring his employees, right? 
and they were coming from California. And so what we're experiencing, we had a similar situation with. Well, he didn't just bring them. He also got massive tax breaks to do so. No, you know your government. No, 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 no. I just, no, I just, I, I just always say that because when I hear people talk about how he is this self-built, I said no, he ain't no self-built. Oh yeah. There were billions of dollars in tax subsidies. Oh yes. Called corporate welfare. That's how he's able to do it. Yes, yes. But I digress. Go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Just to be clear. This is one of those things that Texas does all the time. Hey, come over here, and we'll give you, we'll hook you up. Like Texas that's a, yeah, exactly. And so, um, but there were people that had moved. We also brought Toyota, which is right here in our area, and so we had people moving. So we have people that are selling maybe a 1,500 square foot home in California for like a million dollars. Well, they'll come pay, you know, twice as much as the asking price on say, you know, 2,000 square feet, because they're like, I'm still winning, right? And I'll give you cash. And so that's making it very difficult for us as well. So when I talk to Secretary Fudge and I'm talking about these things, one of the things that she told me is that this particular administration is looking at those people that are saying, listen, I've been renting this home forever. I could have bought it. The problem is I'm not making enough money to have a large enough savings so that I can make the down payment. So one of the things that they're looking at doing is putting down payments on the back end of a loan so that people can just move in right away. These people that have been paying consistently, they can do mm -hmm. it. And that gives them an opportunity because we all know that you can build wealth when you own something like a home. So it gives them a chance to do just that. That is something that I want to explore more. I also said that because housing is one of those number one issues, what I want to do is I want HUD to come down to Dallas, Texas, District 30. I want to have a roundtable conversation, but I don't just want the developers. I want the people. I want the seniors. So even when I was out today, I was talking to a senior and they said, listen, uh, they named off, I won't name off this specific uh, senior living facility. They said you have to have $230,000 just to move in. That's a senior facility. And so we've got to talk about these things and see what additional options we have. And we obviously have to move past COVID. I think that we're still struggling, but that is making the cost of building a home mm -hmm. go up as well. But the housing issue is also tied to economics because uh, in 2013, uh, some $23.09 billion in small business loans uh, were given out. Black people only got $385 million. <laughs> Uh, and and I, I, I was very critical of the Obama administration. Trust me, the president was not happy uh, with my questioning, and I really did not care uh, because I had a problem with $385 million out of $23 billion. So the reality is no home, no loan, no business. Mm -hmm. And so even though people are, are celebrating right now the number of black women who are starting businesses, the reality is they're starting businesses, but they have half the revenue they were making than they were seven, eight years ago. So it's, say, it's great to say you start a business, but when you have 2.6 million black-owned businesses and 2.5 million have one employee, really we only have 100,000 businesses. Yeah. So the housing piece is directly tied to uh, the economics. When you mention the contracts, uh, what are you going to do to ensure that black people are get, and black businesses are getting the federal contracts? Because right now, only 1.67% of all federal contracts it's $560 billion annually going to black people. No, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do as I was kind of preparing for this run is I wanted to talk to my small businesses. And I specifically wanted to talk to my contractors because at that time, we knew that the infrastructure, infrastructure dollars were about to flow. And what I wanted to understand... So I'm 100 and I, uh, I think uh, Pete Buttigieg, I think he told me it's $160 billion. <laughs> that they're about to drop, it's even, or even more than that. But literally, it, it, it's multiple billions, and again, we're getting 1.67%. Absolutely. So, you know, when I talked to the contractors, my question was, what are the obstacles? Tell me what's going on, because I can't fix what I don't know is broken, right? And so some of the conversations that we've talked about is bonding, and that being a huge uh, impediment for some of these um, contractors that yep. are trying to, and so, so my deal is, and I plan to once I get past this race that finishes in six days, um, not that I'm counting, uh, one of the things that I want to do is have a more in-depth conversation. One of the things that I thought about is we have so many programs, right? That's what we, we, we lead in programs on the federal level. And so if there is a way for me to come up with a creative program so that we can work it out so that some of these businesses that they're saying, no, 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 they don't qualify for the bonding. We can get around that, right? So, well, yeah, but, but yeah, bonding is one issue. The other issue is with your 8A programs, African-Americans 
uh, your limit is only $9 million. But for Native Americans, the cap is $100 million. Also, we're only in it for nine years when, if you're Native American, you can be in it for, uh, for, for forever. Yeah. And, so, and so the reality is, for many businesses, they can't even, that, that nine million simply is, is not enough. Right. And so that's also uh, part of the piece. Another piece is also the pay, the uh, pay schedule. When you're paying, when you're paying after 100 and, uh, 120 to 180 days, you literally are having to float your business yeah. for four to six months. Yeah. If you got, you, you may have a $10 million contract, but if you don't have Not a line of credit, anything. you literally exactly. cannot float your business. Yeah. No, these are all things that we need to advocate for. It, you know, you can't just be a representative without expressing exactly what they're going through. And one of the reasons that I'm saying once I'm done in six days that that's going to be part of that tour is because I want to hear what District 30 is struggling with, especially my people that are here on the ground. And I want to make sure that they can tell their stories. I want to make sure that when I'm filing legislation, I'm filing it with them in mind and I'm advocating and saying, hey, listen, this is what I'm hearing. Tell me why this is, is why this exists in this way. What can we do to change this? Because we have to start promoting equity and it can't just be um, in one area. It's got to be in education. It's got to be in housing. It's got to be in economics overall. This is why we've been so far behind in general, because we can't just fight in one specific area. We got to fight for equity across the board. And the reason I think that's important because, um, go ahead. Um, I've covered city government, state government, uh, county government, federal government, and my experience has been, and this is no disrespect to any politician, they don't, look, they pass laws, <laughs> but they don't actually understand the nuances of it. Uh, I have been working with CBC members over the past several years dealing with black-owned media. And so they're like, hey, we passed this for versus They added $70 million more million in the census budget, but they froze out the black-owned advertising agency, and black folks, black-owned media did not get a significant number. A billion dollars is spent every year by the federal government on advertising. Black-owned media gets $51 million. Mm. It's 1% out of $1 billion. Mm -hmm. And so I've been walking CBC members through literally this is when they do. This is how they do this. This is how they create this. This is how they put this, put this in in, uh, in the in the pathway. And so it's the nuance of the problem that a lot of a lot of members don't understand. Mm -hmm. They just figure, look, look, we did our job getting it passed. Yeah, but once it goes to the bureaucrats, that's when the whole game changes and how folks are frozen out. So I think that is crucial. Listening to the actual business owners who say, no, no, no. They told you this, but this is what the reality is. And this is the case on the federal level, state, county, city level. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I hear you on this, and, and I completely understand. One of the things that the Congresswoman can tell you about is constituent services. And having people in your office that know exactly who I need to call to give me the answers. And that's one of the best things I think we've done all session long. Um, since I've been elected is knowing who to call to go ahead and get through all the red tape and get the real answers. We don't need to say, oh, we'll call this person or call that person. I need someone who knows who we need to call and find out why there's a backlog, why this is clogged up. That is what we do every single day, especially when it comes to federal issues, whether it's those of you that are trying to figure out why is it that, um, I'm not getting my disability, right? Like, we're the ones that have to be the advocate for the constituents, mm -hmm. and that even includes those business constituents. We have to know what your issues are. You have to tell us and give us an opportunity to try to figure out why this isn't working in the way that it was intended to work. Uh, another major question I asked earlier, student loan debt. Uh, are you going to uh, do all you can to push this president? Uh, to actually uh, get rid of it. The White House is still sort of, oh, we're not quite sure if we have the authority. <laughs> you, where do you stand on student loan debt? Uh, I still have debt, so I'm all for getting rid of it. <laughs> Listen, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done to stimulate the economy, and we've got to figure out what those things are going to be. Um, as we've already talked about, housing is a problem, right? If you've got somebody who has, say, a thousand dollar a month payment as it relates to their student loans, right? And they're trying to move into a home. But when we started talking about those people that can't save, some of them are in that category. Um, they're very responsible. They're trying to do their part. They're trying to pay their student loans. They're trying to make sure they're taking care of their kids. And at the same time, they do want the American dream. They want to own a home. But this is one of those things that we may be able to help them out with. 
So I'm, I'm all for it. All right. I'm going to open the questions. Well, in, in just a second, I got a few more questions I, I want to ask. I got the uh, folks have been sending text messages. They've been sending all kinds of <laughs> stuff along those lines. Um, one, one of the texts I got, uh, and, and so if you could clarify or explain this whole issue, I've seen statements from the family of both of Jean saying they don't want you talking about their case. You did nothing. You were not involved. Uh, what actually happened with that case? What was your involvement and why are they having that position right now? Yeah, so um, I hadn't really talked about this, uh, but long story short, uh, the reality is that my opponent reached out to them um, for the purpose of, sadly enough, uh, bringing more harm than good to an already hurting family and making false accusations that the only reason I got the number of votes I got is because I claimed to be their lawyer. Um, their lawyers are Daryl Washington along with Ben Crump two people that support me unequivocally. And when they were going through the trial, um, my friends know that I do a lot of criminal law as well as the civil rights stuff. And so they called me in and I would say, okay, well, this is what's going on. And just kind of explaining and being like an extra person, but I was never representing them. And I don't want anybody to think that I was going out saying that I was representing them and that's where my votes came from and that kind of stuff. And so. You know, this is just part of the ugly side of politics. What was so upsetting is that uh, I do know this family quite well. Um, we worked together on legislation down in Austin. I didn't even talk about that, you know? And so I'm like, this is this is crazy because I actually have stuff that I could talk about. So you were, what you're saying, you were not part of the legal team, no. uh, but you're saying that um, you offered advice and counsel to the individuals because just of your previous a prior relationship. Absolutely. That's it. Nothing more. Talk, but you said you did work with the family. So talk, talk about what work did you do with the family when it came to legislation in Austin? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things I know all of y'all remember, because some of y'all were texting during the trial and y'all said, what's this castle? What, what were y'all calling it? Castle Doctrine. I know, but they were calling it something else. <laughs> but anyway, people were like, what is Castle Doctrine, essentially? Um, and so I was explaining it to them because that was one of those turning points for a lot of people in that trial. They were like, wait a minute. Now he went into, she went into his home. And so actually I had to rewrite the council doctrine and I actually had to do it by hand because ledge council could not get it right. Like the way that they were writing it, it wasn't going to have the effect that I needed. Um, I made sure that I called the judge in that case, um, Judge Tammy Kent as I was trying to rewrite it and I said, hey, judge, if it said this, would you have still given this instruction? Um, and so finally, once I got it done and she said, nope, I wouldn't have given the instruction. Um, at that point in time, I made sure that the family testified and this is something y'all can run tape on, but um, they testified. And on that day, most people don't understand that most bills, they kind of come through committee, you lay them out and we usually don't vote on them that day. Um, usually they're set for a later date to vote on. And in this particular case, I had them testify and I got that bill out of committee that same night with a nine and O vote. Every single person, Democrat and Republican, voted for that bill. But be clear, this is the first time I say anything about it on the campaign trail because right now, um, while I know that police brutality is one of those things that we will continue to have to fight for and talk about, I think that the average voter knows that that is a natural wheelhouse for me. And that is not the only thing that we'll be doing on the federal level. And so um, I wanted to focus on the issues that are presently plaguing the majority of us, um, no matter who you are. And it really, it boils down to the economic issues whether it's in contracting or whether it's in, um, you know, housing or whatever it is. I mean, we had to deal with the Internet. You know, I learned a lot about the Internet this session, right? Because it was one of those few things that the, the Republicans that were in rural Texas could understand those that dealt with, say, southern sectors of urban Texas. Because um, many of you may not know that the Internet access is completely different in certain portions of the southern sector. And when I say that, um, you know, I describe it as like when I used to go to my granny house. Um, and after a while, if you were running the water too long, it just would start to kind of just shoosh, 
right? Like, it was hardly anything that would come out. And so, like, what we were experiencing in so many portions of the southern sector is basically the Wi-Fi that was like, shoot, so many people got the water on right now. And so, you know, um, that was one of the things that I learned about. But rural Texas was having a similar issue. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to actually pass bipartisan leg legislation as it relates to that because I'm thinking to myself, well, now I've got kids that have to learn at home. And we've got issues with the internet. So I had teachers that told me, yeah, I caught COVID going out, taking hot spots to the kids in my school. And then I was having to educate their parents on how to use it and all those things. And I just want to say special love to the teachers. Um, we, we didn't do y'all right this session. Um, you know, we did lose teachers because they literally loved their jobs and loved the kids. And so we've always seemingly underfunded education. Um, and I think it just went to the next level this session, sadly enough, considering how much more money we were going to need to protect our teachers. Many folks uh, first heard about you when you and other Democrats came to Washington, D.C., uh, fighting voter suppression bills. That, that's why I first, first met. Uh, you as well uh, came on the show. Um, uh, your opponent is, is, has, has been saying that uh, you helped the Republicans uh, in Austin when it came to the voter suppression bill. Uh, what is your, by not voting, what is your response to that criticism or that allegation? Listen, it's, it's really sad because we're playing Republican-like games in a Democratic primary. That's what we're doing. We're, we're lying because you don't have anything to say about yourself. So let me set the record straight. The Democrats that failed Texans to the extent that we saw so many people be disenfranchised. And I know y'all read the reports about the number of people whose ballots were rejected. That was always the intent. Let me be clear. That was not by accident. This was never about voter fraud. Never was. So what happened is the only thing that we could do was break quorum, right? Because the numbers were we only had 67 Democrats. We have 150 people in the House. All right, so that means we don't have the numbers. That means there's 83 Republicans and 67 Democrats. So how do you stop such bad legislation from moving? You deny the quorum. Well, we were backstabbed. People made deals. They came back. I don't know if y'all remember that. Remember how they were like, oh, some of them went back. Well, I didn't go back because I was representing for my district when I said that I was willing to do whatever it took to stop voter suppression because I didn't care that I had a warrant out for my arrest because people died. We all know what John Lewis went through. I didn't care about that. But there were people, there were people that cared about a chairmanship, which half of y'all don't know if y'all say reps got chairmanships or not. They cared about chairmanships, vice chairmanships, there were people that were stressed about redistricting because they made threats about, oh, I'm going to mess your district up so you can't win it. So they decided to come back. So if I'm not there because I decided that I was going to stand up for my district and stay out, then no, I can't vote on a bill because I was staying out. The people that helped the Republicans, the people that helped the Republicans were those that went back. And to try to lie is my issue. Because there are people that don't know how all of this works. There are people that just want to vote for somebody to represent them and to be real and to be honest and to be dishonest tells me where you are in this race. If you can't win by being honest, then maybe you shouldn't have run. Oh, we're going to take questions, so here's how we're going to, uh, oh, those are questions right there. I thought we, I, I thought <laughs> they gave we, me a whole thing. I thought we had a microphone here for the questions. They, they submitted them. Okay. All right, so. <laughs> and then they gave them to me. I don't know why they didn't give them to me. All right, uh, let's see. Let's see, who asked this question? If you can stand up. As you know, Republicans are out for blood. How would you stand up for truth, social justice, and voting rights? Who asked the question? <laughs> All right, then. What's your name? Sharon? All right. Sharon's that, question. Listen, that's a great question. Um, what most people don't understand, one of the, the bills that I worked the hardest on was Brianna's bill. Um, this was all about no-knock warrants. And what we did is we did our research. We found out that in the Republican platform, 
there actually was language that said that we should limit the use of no-knock warrants. So ultimately, I brought gun owners of America together with Black Lives Matter. They were on the same page saying, listen, we're going to advocate for this. I work with law enforcement because there were law enforcement officers that said, listen, we have lost our own going into these homes in this way where somebody just says, oh, there's drugs in there. Go do a no knock. And there are no drugs. Somebody is startled. We live in the same state. Remember, that has the council doctor, right? So what does that mean? Somebody come in your home. What can you do? You can shoot them, right? So how safe is it to have a no-knock warrant in the state of Texas? And so I was able to look at all the different pieces, and while we know that— You can shoot them when they walk on your property. <laughs> no. Thank, thank you for—it's the curvilege. I got you. I got you. I'm just—listen, I got you. They step one foot. I, but we, we not—listen, don't, don't be going and shooting people. No, I'm, I'm just—I'm just— Now I'm putting on my legal hat, especially you— people that's in here. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> listen, I, I want to keep y'all out of all problems, but, <laughs> but, but the point is, a lot of these bills, you know, or a lot of these issues, they try to make it to where it's Democratic or Republican or it's anti-police or, or not, and it's not that way. A lot of these things, like I said, law enforcement is like, yo, okay, yeah, we, we're not really a fan of no-knocks, right? And so I was able to work on that. We also see that... Um, Tim Scott, he's the one that they usually turn to, and he's the one that's working on some. Don't don't do it, Berlin. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, right? But like, we gotta start somewhere, and I think that um, the further right wing of the Republicans actually align with us on a number of things. I mean, I got my marijuana legislation out of committee in a bipartisan way because they were like, oh, that's freedom. It's, it's, it's growing from, it's natural, right? Like, so you have to find what is it that they claim to believe and then make sure that you line up your bill. Oh, yeah. And oh, I, 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 I have no problem working with, with the other side. What I don't tolerate when the folks lie. Oh, well. And the reality is Senator Tim Scott lied. He went on face, he did. He went on face the nation and he said that it was a bridge too far because Democrats were trying to defund police departments uh -huh. that did not pass certain laws. And he told Margaret Brennan that. My problem with Face the Nation, they didn't do their damn research. Uh -huh. I know we in church, but I was going to cuss at least one time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and, and, the reason, and the reason that angered me is because uh, a year earlier, Senator Tim Scott actually had in his own bill to withhold funds from police departments uh -huh. He, and his own deputy chief of staff even said that this is the only way we're going to get them to act upon it. And the reason I don't have respect for him on this very issue is because he was very talkative in his text messages with me about, about, about the bill. Yet when I asked him and his staff about their own bill a year earlier, he's been radio silent. Mm -hmm. And I got the text messages. You got the receipts. No, I got the receipt. And he has not responded to me. And I've asked now six different times, and they will not answer it when we actually have. No, your bill said this. You said this. So the very thing that he criticized Democrats in December, mm -hmm. he actually proposed that very thing the year earlier. But now he want to act like he can't answer the question. No, and I, and I feel you on this, because this is when you have to well, find I read those... the text messages. You got one more <laughs> No, but you got you to find those triggers, right? You know that some of them only respond to law enforcement. You know, when we were trying to make sure that they didn't give guns to everyone in the state of Texas, I was the first one trying to call the police. Like, hey, I need y'all to come talk to the other side, you know, because they're supposed to. And most cops disagree with it. But this I know, is, but they pass the it one, anyway. But this is the one time they don't want to listen to cops. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. But I was like, if they're going to listen to anybody, it ain't going to be me. I'm going to have to get the popo, right? And so, like, you have to know. And you have to keep these lines of communication open. You know, there are those that want to say, oh, as a civil rights lawyer, you're anti-law enforcement. It's just not true. I had law enforcement support when I ran for the state house. I have law enforcement support right now. Um, and it normally comes from the minority portions of law enforcement, right? So we had um, Dallas Black Police. They supported me when I was running for the State House. We've got the Latinos um, Police Association that's supporting me now for this congressional run because I know I'm gonna need to call y'all because sometimes they're just not gonna listen to me. But y'all know what I'm talking about and we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see who asked this question here. How do you address the criticism that you were recently elected for office and are now running for a different one? All right, who asked that question? 
All right, I came from over here. All right, what's your name? Shanae. Shanae. All right, don't be scared. You wrote it. I was about to say, it's because you called her out. That's it don't matter. Right. That's my law. I'm, I'm, I'm putting a <laughs> face to the question. <laughs> it's all right. It's a question. All right, answer it. Well, she was answering it for you. It's ridiculous. Listen, the, the reality is that I'm the only one that's ever been elected to do anything, right? Um, and so, you know, as an elected official, it comes down to what you do, right? And so we know that I was named freshman of the year by at least three different organizations and is one of the most effective legislators in the country. And so it's not necessarily how long I'm there. It's what I've done while I've been there because you can find a lot of people... A lot of people that have been there for quite some time, and you're like, what's their name? What they do? I ain't never seen them. They been doing anything? Exactly. And so, you know, I, it's one of those... It, well, and also, I mean, this, and again, this is not, I'm not, I ain't, it's not a defense. It's just, it's just fact. Last night, uh, Summer Lee, uh, a sister, uh, won the Pennsylvania 12th District, uh, the Democratic that. primary, the Pennsylvania 12th. But she was also running for re-election for her state position. So she was on the ballot twice. Mm -hmm. And if anybody uh, pays any attention to uh, even history, the Michael Dukakis in 1988 uh, selected uh, Senator Lloyd Benson to be his vice president running mate. Lloyd Benson also ran for re-election as a, t a United States senator. So while he was on the ballot as uh, Michael Dukakis' vice president, he also was on the ballot as a United States senator from Texas. So that actually... Happen. So, for anybody, I mean, that's that actually that, the law allows it. Some states have they have a law where if you run for one office, you have to resign the other. Texas is not one of those states. And so, I did not have to resign, but I do want y'all to know that there's one person that is making real sacrifices in this race. I won and I fought to get to the state house. Many of you know I only won by 90 votes. I had to come up against all the money, I had to come up against all the endorsements. And I had five opponents, and we made it over the hump. I am unable to run for re-election from my seat. And so while I'm continuing to serve and I will serve out my term, which will end in January, I had to give up my seat if I wanted to try to do this. The other thing I had to give up is I'm not allowed to practice law. After the last 16 years, the only thing that I've ever done, I'm not allowed to practice law and be a congressperson. Now, whatever consulting my opponent does, she's able to still do that. So she's not giving up very much. But I want you to know that regardless of the sacrifices, I think that we need the people that know us best and are going to fight for us. And so I believe that each and every one of you is worth whatever sacrifices I have to make to make sure that we have someone who is knowledgeable and is passionate about you in D.C. I'm part of that. And part of that is because Texas legislators are considered part-time, yeah. uh, whereas their full-time salaries are uh, in Congress. Um, where do you stand on expanding the court? All right, who asked that question? All right, is your name? No. Say it again? No. Nana? All right, where do you stand on expanding the court? I want to expand Supreme it. Supreme Court. I know. I want to expand it. Listen. Well, I know you know what the, I say the court. Okay, okay, Everybody okay, don't know okay, what the court okay, means. Okay, okay. Ain't right. the basketball court. <laughs> 94 feet. No, the Supreme Court. No, listen. Um, it, it's interesting. Today, Congressman uh, Mondaire Jones endorsed my candidacy, and he actually has a bill to expand the court. Um, I am concerned. I know many of you probably watched as we saw uh, Katanji uh, um, sit in front of those senators, where they were attempting to tear her down every which way. And one of the things that they talked about was judicial activism, right? <laughs> and they want to say, oh, you're not going to be a judicial activist, are you? No, I won't, right? And they asked all about her record and all that kind of stuff. Well, you were kind of lenient over here. I mean, just all kinds of ridiculousness, right? And at the end of the day, she sat there with so much grace. She persevered. And ultimately, they still voted against her, right? They did. They voted against her no matter how well-versed she was. Well, let's look back at history, okay? We had at least two justices who were supposedly going to weigh in on the wrong side of Roe v. Wade, who sat in front of senators going through this same process. They were specifically asked about Roe v. Wade. 
Y'all know that they said, oh, no, 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 that's the law of the land. It's, it's solid. It's good. Star decisis. Right? And what happens? Well, we don't know, right? This is all speculation, Politico, put it out there. And so just thinking about how cutthroat the Republicans have been, in my opinion, um, there are a number of justices that ended up on the court because they decided that they were going to say, not grant President Obama his appointment. And right now, I am concerned about if there is a place in which our Supreme Court will stop. I personally don't believe that it's going to stop with Roe v. Wade. I believe that we have to be concerned about other constitutional rights. We know that we just got same-sex marriage. We just got that. Like, when you compare it to Roe v. Wade. And so I think that um, this court has decided that they're going to play church in the court. And so I think they're trying to roll back the hands of time. And so I think that it is a time to start to be a little bit more aggressive and stop kind of playing pity pat. We also used to have, for people, again, most people have no idea about it. We used to have nine circuit courts. There are now 13 circuit courts. Right, we're growing. So you have 13 <laughs> circuit courts, but you haven't changed, uh, you That's haven't changed uh, nine. And the reality is we used to actually have more than nine, uh, nine justices. So th that number has changed yeah. uh, in, in American history. Uh, you talked about in terms of how Republicans operate. While, while Republicans are playing chess, Dems are playing tic-tac-toe. <laughs> I think that's being generous. Uh, they are gerrymandering, changing laws. What is the counter plan for Dems uh, to keep the integrity of our voice uh, through voting? Uh, who asked the question? Oh, you asked the same question? Oh, so you're going to get too high. I was going to say. Okay. Yeah, I, I, right. So what, they gave you two cards, you feel both out. Okay, I got you. All right. So what she want to know is how hard are you going to fight if you, if you were elected? Yeah, so um, many Are you going to swing? I'm swinging. I'm always swinging. Y'all haven't seen them interviews about me talking about Abbott and them. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're currently engaged in litigation. Uh, myself, the Congresswoman, Sheila Jackson Lee, as well as um, Al Green down in Houston. Um, the three African-American seats uh, in the state of Texas. And, you know, sadly enough, we have to fight these wars on the floor. Litigation with... Ooh, With the state of Texas. Got it. So, started this fight on the House floor. I had four redistricting lawyers that trained me up so that I can make a record. Because you can't just go to court, right? You got to have a record. So, um, a lot of the conversations that we had was me talking to the congresswoman to make sure that I could put the things on the record that I needed to put on the record so that we could go to court. But y'all know who appoints those that sit in the courts, right? Yes. Right? So we have a lot of courts in which we probably are going to struggle. And sadly enough, ultimately, this stuff will most likely end up in the Supreme Court. Right. Where we're struggling, right? And so that's another reason to push for the expansion right now. Um, and so, but, you know, I'm engaged in litigation. Um, I'm going to be able to uh, talk to my experiences, specifically on the House floor, about how, you know, I'm giving my documents to another freshman, but he a Republican, and then they going into a back room, and then they telling me whether or not I can present my amendment. Oh, it was, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and just the inconsistencies with what the chairman was telling me we were going to do, and, you know, those are the things that we have to bring out, but this is why you have to have someone that understands these things, mm -hmm. because if you don't, you just have somebody that's like a seat holder, and, and we need more. Are you concerned about the ballooning federal debt? How do you think we can solve that? Who asked the question? All right, what's your name? I'm Mark Lamowitz. Mark? Yeah. All right. Mark, what's the about the debt? I, I'm concerned. Now, the fix, that's a whole other issue. Um, you know, so I don't think that you fix anything with one thing, right? I don't think it's like a broad stroke and you just fix something. I think these are all multi-layered things. And so one of the things that I think we need to do is, number one, see if there's anywhere that we can trim any spending, right? That's the big question. But for me, I'm always an advocate of, is there anywhere else we can get money um, versus saying, okay, taxes. And granted, taxes are always an option. It's always on the table. But I'm going to tell you, taxes is like last for me. Um, and so I know that there's definitely a lot of talk about the rich need to be getting taxed higher, right? Um, and so that is an option. Or, or would you repeal the Trump tax cuts that was passed by Congress? Oh, absolutely. Anything you
Well, well, they actually lowered the uh, lowered the uh, threshold from 43 to 39. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, but figuring out like where are these niches where we can find some money. Another thing for me though, I'll be honest, <laughs> it's become controversial. Don't know why. Um, and I'm sure there will be a tape edited of this. Um, you know, I passed or I filed a lot of marijuana legislation. Um, we need to figure out other ways that we can make money. Um, and so I think that that's a great option because the idea that it's not legal, that doesn't mean it's not something that's around. We know that it's around. And so if we can make sure that what people are ingesting is cleaner, and if we're making sure that we're taxing it and we're regulating it, it's just like we talked about alcohol at some point in time um, and, and that situation. And then we finally got past that. We need to find other streams of revenue, and I think that that's another option. Speaking of marijuana, how will you ensure that, um, that African Americans are participants in that when it comes to dispensaries because we were most impacted by marijuana oh laws? Oh my gosh. Uh, and what we have seen in Illinois, we have seen in California, uh, where uh, many African Americans have been frozen out. I, I interviewed the only one sister who had a dispensary uh, in Maryland. So here you have this multi-billion dollar industry uh, that black people are still in jail with marijuana laws, yet African Americans are not benefiting economically from this uh, from this new economy. Absolutely. So, but obviously, when these laws are passing, they're passing on the state level. Right. And so, if we pass on the federal level, then we can start to say, "Hey, this is what the participation should look like," because it's now federal. But I can't tell another state what to do when we're not actually passing anything on the federal level and we're only kind of just living by this memo agreement like, hey, we won't come in if your state decides that you're going to pass it. And by the way, we are going to tax it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to tell you that those people that have already been to prison, say because they were growing plants before it was legal, listen, they can't participate, right? Like th like the feds have placed rules right. on this, right? And we know that- Which is kind of the dumbest thing because probably they probably more expert on the subject. I know, I know, I know, right? And- I'm just saying. And I'm for those that are saying, you know, hey, what are we going to do with all these people that have been incarcerated and now they don't have opportunities? Well, some of them right. would. They would have more opportunities. But what we see is a lot of those uh, persons and organizations that try to get into the business, they are limited and they are shut out because, once again, they want a net worth up here. You need at least a million dollars or two oh, yeah. million dollars. And so it goes back to the economics of it again and looking to say, OK, well, if it's real minority and when I say real minority, I mean color, not just I went and added my wife to it. Right. Um, when we look at that and say, you know what, we recognize that there have been disparities. And so maybe I'm going to lower the threshold under these circumstances. And so there are things that we can work out, but we first got to get some kind of legislation on the federal level. The question, uh, what is your idea of African, African affairs as to how African Americans relate to African countries? Is this George's? Yes, uh, George. George? All right, George asked the question. Um, go ahead. Right. Um, listen, you know, I think that um, one thing we don't talk about enough is that to be a congressperson means that you literally are um, an international figure. We're not just limited to our districts. We're not just limited to Texas. We're not just limited to the U.S. But we actually have to have strong international relationships. Um, we know that the stability of this world relies upon um, us having our allies and knowing where our friends are and promoting um, democratic states anywhere that we can um, in the world. And so it was one of those things that frustrated me because I say we allegedly promote democracy everywhere else, but what are we doing at home? That's a whole other thing, right? Um, but that's why I think it is important that we start at home and start to look like the democracy that we promote throughout the world. And the more democratic states that we have, the more allies that we have, the more that we start to work in other countries, the better we're going to be. And so for me, it's a matter of making sure that we're keeping those lines of communication open, especially in a place like the DFW. We know that we are completely diverse. And so uh, the Congresswoman has had some very strong ties um, to many different communities um, that I've been able to be introduced to. And so I plan to continue to build upon relationships, um, not just with the African communities, but also my Asian communities and so forth. Crypto has uh, fallen through the floor in the past couple of weeks. Um, should it be regulated by the federal government? So for me, it's a data thing. 
I need someone to come to me and say, because my concern was this. If crypto was going to become, say, the basis of everything that we do as far as um, our actual uh, money, then you gotta you got a lot to do because that's got to be stable, right? Um, as it relates to what's going on right now, I can tell y'all that there's a lot of nuances about crypto that I don't understand. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out. They're talking to me about mining. It was a long conversation where I was trying to figure out what, what are you mining and where are you mining, right? Um, and so I think that I want those that are experts in the field to talk to me. Tell me what all is going on. Why did the bottom fall out? What's happening? And then let's figure out how we can protect those that need to be protected. All right. Let's see here. Um, most challenging part of running in this congressional race. Who asked it? All right. Uh, probably the last. <laughs> um, listen, you know, it's, it's tough because you're trying to educate people on what is the job, what all it takes, and why I'm qualified. And at the same time, you know, people want you to deflect and deal with things that are nothing more than a distraction versus talking about the issues that matter to y'all most. And so it can be frustrating that you're constantly not focusing on what matters. Um, I think that we've done a pretty good job of just trying to kind of keep ourselves focused on us and our race um, and run that race. But, you know, we've all seen it before. We've seen it time and time again where there is a front runner. And so therefore they'll say and do anything to try to gain points. Um, so that's been the most frustrating part, especially since we are two black women. And I, I want to be clear that I'm not her enemy. <laughs> Right? Like, I'm not our enemy. The enemy are those that are going after our rights. And so, to come, to, to come after me and to discourage voters, I think it's just unfair to the voters. Because voters then look and they say, oh, it's politics as usual. I don't want it to be that. Because I need everybody excited about voting. I need everybody to show up in November. I need them to believe. And if they're saying, well, they're no better in the Democratic Party than the Republican Party because all they do is lie and tear people apart, then how do you encourage participation? And so that's the most frustrating thing because I care about people being excited and wanting to vote and believing that they have someone that is going to be there and is going to fight for them, not fight against them. All right, we got two minutes left. Those were all the questions that are uh, on the card. Does anyone have a question? I'll take a question from the floor. I got it, I got it. All right, so we've got a mic over here. But you can just stand up with a microphone's right here. Probably easy, yep, there you go. I'm right there. I know what this so is about. Yeah. Oh, 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 hold on one second. Oh, hold on, hold on. I got you, I got you. No, no, hold, here's what I want to do right here. Let's keep distance in terms of from the microphone. My question, I guess I want to make a statement. You're part of the national debt based on 330 million people is $134,000. Everyone in this chapel owes $134,000. If you have a home, if you're four people in your home, and it's what's causing inflation. It's called deficit spending. Mm -hmm. And it's on page 202 of the civics book in Texas. Uh, that The civics book in Texas is 647 pages, and they only teach it for a half a semester. And that is the problem of no one knowing what country we really live in, and the Constitution is not being followed. Well, one of the okay. Well, I know more about the Constitution than John Roberts. I got you. Well, 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 well I'll tell you right. First of all, when you don't even have requirements in schools, people even have oh, financial literacy. That yeah. itself is a problem uh, as well. Um, yes. Next question. All right. So here's the deal. Uh, all the people in line stay right there. No one else get in line because I don't want to be all throughout the door. So we're gonna stay right there. So I'll go right ahead. Question. Mines is a community issue. The community issue that we're having all around Dallas County and Texas, Dallas is number two in human trafficking. 
And being a human trafficking survivor, I want to know what will you do on the federal level to help our, our people, to help our girls. And right now, and I think you were the only one that mentioned this, Roland, was 65,000 women and girls that were being trafficked around our, state, our country, mm -hmm. and nobody's addressing it. I want to know what, I'm going to ask her the same question, what are you going to do? And as a survivor that's out here in the trenches, boots on the ground, we got girls missing every single yep. day in Dallas County, and with us being number two, what are you going to help us to do on a federal level oh, to help happen. this problem? I need help. We need help as advocates. We need help as rescuers to do what we need to do, because I can't do it alone. Got it. And you're sitting there, just like she'll be sitting there, whoever's sitting there, I will ask them the same question. I got you. And what, that's also the way we have our black and missing uh, every single day on the show, because you're all right. Go ahead. Yeah, no, Tanya is an amazing advocate. If y'all do not know Thanks. who she is, and she has a nonprofit. And so one of the things that I actually want to work with is, you know, on a federal level, we definitely need to make sure that we are supporting with money, right? And so what I'm experiencing and talking to so many of my nonprofit folk, specifically in the district, is they don't know what all is available or they don't have access to the grant writer and things like that. So advocating for the funds that you need because it's going to take the state legislation. And I will say that Symphonia Thompson has led so many great things. I mean, most most of you probably don't understand, but this session, that was one of the things we could get past, was some trafficking issues because Texas is a leading state. And so now, all these hotels where they're trafficking girls, now there will be a penalty on them if they are not training up their staff so that they can identify what trafficking looks like. And so when we're, so when we're talking about it, and obviously trafficking can go across interstate lines. And so when you start to cross interstate lines, that's exactly when you end up in the federal court, okay? That's when your AUSAs can charge somebody on the federal level. And so we've got options as it relates to the criminal justice system. I've never had to try anybody as it relates to trafficking on the federal level. I'll be be honest with you, the trafficking was always drugs that I specifically tried, but I've got to make sure that I stay in touch with people like you because this is your subject matter expertise. And so, so what I, so I want to, I want to be clear to be an elected official doesn't mean I know everything, number one, but what you can't do is be upset that your elected doesn't know what they don't know. But what you can do is make sure that you always communicate and you do. <laughs> Make sure that you're always communicating, and that goes for any and everybody. A lot of times we get our ideas for, bill, our ideas for bills directly from you. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So I'm going to take, so take these questions. Go, go, we're going to go to 840, so just be mindful. Uh, be, be very precise with your question and the answer. Go. Okay, I'll keep it simple. All right, so if elected, what committees would you um, be a member of? Or what committees do you want to sit on uh, if you're in Congress? <laughs> I got you. Um, I got you, bro. Small business. I'm the translator. <laughs> small business and judiciary. Those are two that I really want to sit on. Small business and judiciary. All right, cool. Good afternoon, Congresswoman. Uh, my name is Steven Banda. I know from uh, Zambia. I'm actually a president of uh, Pamosi Zambian Association in DFW. Believe it or not, we've been following you. And as an African people, we want to integrate and begin working with you. Look at the seats that are empty. If you tap into the African community, this place will be full. And we want to start making that subject known. How do you specifically intend to create a symbiotic relationship between us, the African people, and you, so that we can begin working together as one? Because now we are Americans. And there's a lot about America we have learned. This is now our home. We are legalized. We are in education. We are in different sectors. How do you intend, as a young Zambian woman, if I can call you, want to tap that potential and move along with us? Thanks. Are you asking how, you asking how to create a better alliance between African Americans and Africans? Uh, 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 absolutely, because there's a lot of things that we... No, 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 no. I got it. Yes. But that's what you want to ask. Yes. I only the explanation. I got that. Yes. So, so in the district, so in, so in the district, uh, how, how will you create uh, that uh, alliance, if you will, between Africans and African Americans? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, there, there's lots of countries. If we start talking about uh, the continent of Africa, but one of my really good friends is Sir uh, Charles Maduka, and so uh, for me, it's a matter of starting those groups. 
I want you to always be able to come to me. I want to stay in constant communication. I need to know what's going on in your home countries. I need to know what you're experiencing here. And so it's a matter of making sure that you organize and you come and you meet with appointed staff because I need to make sure that I know what your issues are, whoever you are. If you're a teacher, um, if you're a retired person, I need y'all to make sure that y'all come and talk to me. I am absolutely all the way on board. Every single uh, one of these organizations that endorsed me on the state level, you know what? They came back and they endorsed me on the federal level. You know why? Because we had already started those relationships. And while I was in office, I was continually in communication. And that's exactly what I want to do. So y'all got to make sure that y'all organize and y'all make sure that y'all communicate. I'm here for it. I'm here to serve you, not the other way around. Question. Thank you. I'm Carol Harris from Lafayette, and I do a lot traveling around the state of Texas, educating and certifying citizens for mental health. Mm -hmm. So on a federal level, what can you do? What kind of laws can you implement when it comes to mental health? Yeah, that's a that's a actually it's an excellent Thanks. question. Um, <laughs> as somebody who who sat on the MetroCare board, the majority of the issues that I was dealing with from MetroCare, they were state issues. Um, in fact, I had to resign my position on the board so that I could run for the state house because we were having funding issues. Now, there is federal funding available as well, and so having those conversations, like I I have a few friends that own group homes. I need to know what the struggles are. You know, I had some that say, hey, they took the pay down on this particular um, situation. I need to know those things so that we can make sure as, as it relates to federal monies, because mental health in general is still going to be a little bit more localized. Question. Good evening. I am Reverend Dr. Pamela Fox. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and ordained minister, member of Friendship West Baptist Church. Yeah, both of my <laughs> oh, I can uh, and my question is a philosophical question. And my question is, how can you have justice on stolen land where there's been enslavement and genocide and theft? <laughs> It is philosophical. Uh, listen, you know, I, it's interesting because recently I, I participated on a panel where they asked me to define justice. I was actually the speaker, and I was like, oh, Lord, what am I going to do with this question? And the reality is that justice looks a little different for everyone. But I personally believe that justice is not one of those things that I attain. I think it's one of those things that I have to continue to strive for. And I think that you strive for justice in every single way. And so that's why, you know, when it comes down to it, I don't just get to fight for black folk. I have to fight for justice and equity every single day. And honestly, no matter who you are, whether you're elected, whether you're planning to run for office, it's incumbent upon us in our everyday lives to continually fight for justice, whether you're a teacher, whether you're dealing in trafficking, whether you're an elected official. And so that, for me, is what justice looks like. It's not really the thing that I truly believe is attainable, especially for people that look like me. Final question. Uh, good evening. I'm, uh, you talked about uh, wanting to sit on small business seats. I'm here representing uh, my dad's small business, Two Partners Barbecue in South Dallas. <laughs> We all know um, <laughs> And um, one of the questions that I have is in our communities and that greater southwestern communities, we're seeing a downturn of businesses that are black owned, minority owned. What are some of the things that you're looking to do to help boost that economic economy in those areas? Yeah, so that's a great, great question. And it's it's honestly one of the reasons that I want to sit on small business because we have a ton of small businesses right here. Um, so there's a couple of things. From a legislative perspective, I think that number one, I need to get acclimated to all the resources that are available already to those that are in small business. I need to come back to the district. I need to communicate, this is what's available to you. I need to reach out and say, hey, we've got XYZ. I think that this may be something that would be great for y'all. Are y'all interested? And try to help you out with facilitating that situation. Now. Take it outside of uh, just legislation, because as y'all know, legislation can be slow. Anti-lynching just got passed. Just want to be clear, right? But 
one of the things that I think is important is to have someone that is continually building relationships. And so what I want to start doing is connecting some of my larger organizations with some of my small businesses and see what kind of contracting opportunities are available and introduce them. And so if there are these opportunities, that's something that's outside of legislation. That's something that you can use just because they know you're the congresswoman calling and asking, right? Well, what that can do is promote economic growth that helps all of us in our shared district. And so I've started talking to those corporations um, that had already moved in as the, the state rep for House District 100. Amazon moved in. I had a Walmart, uh, as well as uh, the, the six largest beer distributors uh, there in our district, a few other people. And let me tell you, when the storm happened, I was in Austin. Lights didn't go out, everything was fine, but my phone started blowing up and I'm a freshman lawmaker and I don't know what to do. And I've got seniors that don't have access to water. I mean, everybody is freaking out. I call and try to figure out what I can do. I find out I'm really chopped liver as a state elected official in the middle of the winter storm. So what did I do? I called the business community. I called the beer distributors and they said, well, Rep, we distribute beer. I said, I know, but y'all are big. So you got some water? And he said, well, Rep, we distribute beer. I was like, I know, but like, I need you to see if you have water. Well, when he called me back, he had pallets of water. He said, Rep, where do you want, he said, where do you want these pallets to go? And so he delivered them for me. They've also partnered with me so that we could actually get more people vaccinated because sometimes you got to, you know, spice it up a little bit. We've given away things to encourage vaccination. We've vaccinated more folk than any other state house seat because we worked with our business partners. And so I think we got to work with the large ones as well as the small ones and make sure that we connect y'all. So I think that that's something that I can do outside of just the legislation. And also keep in mind on the federal level, uh, they classify small business as 500 oh, yeah. employees. Down. Down. Yeah. Relative. That's a huge, yeah. Again. And most black. Nearly, nearly, all, nearly yep. all of ours have one employee. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so when you, you might think somebody with 400 employees, the federal government classifies them as small. Small business, yeah. That ain't small, but uh, that's how they classify. Um, that is it for us. Uh, let me uh, thank all of you uh, for coming out. We appreciate. We appreciate you taking time out on this Wednesday. Two more days of early voting uh, runoff election. This is not the only runoff race. Uh, there are other races as well, so please familiarize yourself with the other people uh, who are on the ballot. Uh, and so please uh, cast uh, that ballot. Uh, as I say, I voted earlier. My parents, they worked the polls. Uh, so uh, I got to uh, go by. I had to skip the line. It wasn't long. Uh, but, uh, and so uh, shout out to them. Uh, they've been, uh, they, they've worked uh, in politics, run, run phone banks, put up signs. Uh, and some people always ask me, man, how you know so much about politics? I said, well, you didn't have a choice when they said go pass these leaflets out. Uh, so uh, I, so it was funny going to the poll and see the people sitting out there, you know, passing out stuff. I was like, yeah, I remember those days. Uh, so I uh, appreciate that. Uh, Representative Crockett, thank you so very much. Uh, Congressman Eddie Benny Johnson, thank you so very much. Also thank uh, the church for hosting us uh, as well. Uh, all the folks and uh, all of you uh, who are watching uh, on the Black Star Network, we appreciate it uh, as well. Uh, glad to see uh, still uh, almost 2,000 of y'all sitting here watching. That's yeah. just on YouTube, but also on Facebook and the app. Don't forget, download the app, Apple TV, uh, Android TV, Apple phone, Android phone, Roku, Amazon Fire, Xbox, Samsung TV as well. And of course, uh, it's important for y'all to support us what we do uh, when it comes to black-owned media. Uh, the reality is, uh, look, mainstream media, they get the bulk of the advertising dollars. Out of $322 billion spent every single year, black-owned media gets 0.5 to 1% of that. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why we also don't have black-owned media with significant capacity. And so, folks, support us. Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. And Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Uh, and I, I got a message from my mama when I went to go vote. Uh, she said, yeah, your voter registration call at our house. I was like, mama. <laughs> I know y'all been living in my house for like 12 years. I'm like, where our house come from? 
house. I had to mess with her. She talked about our house. I said, Mama, that's my house. What's wrong with you? So I had to mess with her. So uh, always glad to be back uh, here uh, in the district. And again, good to see the congresswoman. And y'all found every time she came on my show, I'd be like, now you know I'm a constituent. <laughs> but I always appreciate uh, you uh, coming on the show. Thank you so very much. Thank all of y'all. And y'all take care. Ha!